Of all the threats that the Star Wars galaxy faced over the millennia, none were as enduring or terrifying as the Dark Lords of the Sith. Just the name Sith was wrapped in layers of fear and mystery associated with empires of death and incredibly powerful megalomaniacs. For thousands of years, the Sith were the greatest enemies of the Republic and the Jedi Order. Their greatest Dark Lords were forces of nature and their armies ravaged many a star system. This video is the start of a new series exploring the full history of these shadowy lords and their wars with the Jedi. And today, we'll be starting at the very beginning, with the tale of how the Dark Lords of the Sith came to be. The story of the Sith began on Korriban, a remote planet deep in the Outer Rim. The original Sith were a species of red-skinned humanoids, and most of them were Force-sensitive to some degree. They were naturally drawn to the dark side, as they were instinctively violent and aggressive. But despite this innate bloodlust, the Sith steadily became an advanced species. Their tribes developed into kingdoms with complex social structures that fought wars with weaponry enhanced with Force alchemy. The brutality of the Sith was reflected in the societies they built, and so all of these kingdoms adopted rigid caste systems. These castes were so entrenched and long-lasting that the Sith actually diverged into different subspecies along caste lines, a process accelerated by primitive dark side alchemical techniques. The dominant caste was the Kisai, the priest caste whose members were especially strong in the Force and devoted their lives to intellectual pursuits, leadership and the study of the Force. Below them were the Zuguruk, the engineer caste, who were intelligent but not as strong in the Force. They lived relatively privileged lives but not nearly to the degree of the Kisai. Below them were the Masasi, the warriors, who were less intelligent but incredibly strong. Over the millennia, a mix of natural selection and alchemy shaped them into towers of claw and muscle. Lastly, there were the Grotu, the slaves, who were treated with extraordinary cruelty by the higher castes. All of the Sith of Korriban adhered to this caste system and roughly the same cultural patterns. Despite their common cultural background, for most of Korriban's early history, the Sith waged constant wars against each other. This cycle of violence was seen as the natural state of life by the Sith, who valued war as other species would value peace. But around 28,000 years before the Battle of Yavin, Sith society changed forever, and the cycle of war on Korriban came to an end. This was due to the ascension of King Adas, the first overlord of the Sith. From the moment he was born, Adas was believed to be special. His skin was obsidian black, a rarity among the Sith, which the Kisai believed meant that Aras was in some way divine. He grew into a great warrior, tall and burly, with tremendous strength in the Force. Aras became master of Sith magic, as the dark side techniques of the Kisai were known, and he used Sith alchemy to create a set of heavy black armor and a great battle axe. This fearsome weapon became Aras' personal symbol and he wielded it in a series of wars against the disparate kingdoms of Korriban. One by one, he and his followers conquered all of the nations of the Sith, uniting Korriban under a single state for the first time. King Aras ruled as a god among mortals, revered and respected by the Sith despite the harshness of his reign. The Kisai proclaimed him the Sitharai, the overlord of the Sith. Aras ruled Korriban for 300 years a period called the Reign of the Axe by the Sith. It was during this period when the Sith made their first contact with the outside galaxy. In 27,700 BBY, Korriban was discovered by the Rakata. They were the dominant species in the galaxy at the time, with their infinite empire unrivaled on the galactic stage. They, like the Sith, were naturally inclined toward the dark side of the Force which they used to power their technology that far outstripped anything the Sith had at the time. The Rakata traveled the stars via force-attuned hyperdrives which homed in on planets with strong force signatures. Korriban was one such world, and when the Rakata discovered it, they devised a plan to conquer it. But before the Rakata began their invasion, they attempted to lull the Sith into a false sense of security. They approached King Adas as well-meaning allies giving them holocron technology and teaching them about the Force. 
It was the Rakata that introduced the Sith to the concept of the Dark Side. Though Sith Force techniques had always been Dark Side in nature, they had previously seen their cycles of violence as a sort of harmony, a natural balance that must not be disturbed. The Rakata taught them otherwise, preaching against all notions of harmony and balance, pushing the Sith to embrace the fullest form of the Dark Side, which King Adas and his followers did. But before long, Adas discovered that the true intentions of the Rakata were to conquer Korriban, and he refused to allow this. As the Rakata finally began their invasion, Adas rallied the kingdom of the Sith against them, fighting a long and bloody war that consumed Korriban. In the end, against all odds, the Sith won. They became the first species to ever defeat the Rakata in open war, and their victory was the beginning of the end for the Infinite Empire, which ultimately collapsed 2,000 years later. But this victory came at great cost. Korriban was rendered desolate by the war, its surface transformed into a lifeless wasteland of red sand, and even as he led his people to victory against the invaders, King Aras was killed in the fighting. The Kingdom of the Sith held together just long enough for the Sith to develop a small interstellar empire. Using co-opted Rakatan hyperdrive technology, most of the Sith fled now desolate Korriban for the ice planet Xyost. Other Sith settled on Jaguada, Thule, and Malachor V, while a sect of Sith heretics who rejected the Dark Side were banished to Tund, the most remote outpost of the Sith. Not long after these settlements were established, however, the Kingdom of the Sith fragmented as many among the Kisai tried to take Aras's place. Once again, Sith civilization descended into a constant state of war, which it remained in for nearly 20,000 years. This time, however, these constant wars weren't just part of a political cycle. They were the result of petty kings scrambling over each other in a pursuit of ultimate power over the Sith. Something almost all of them sought, but almost none of them achieved. This meant that, as the Galactic Republic rose to replace the Rakata in the galaxy beyond, and galactic civilization as we know it formed, the Sith were irrelevant to galactic affairs, too busy fighting each other to be important on a larger stage. Over the course of this period, Aras became mythologized, and his title, Sitharai, came to refer to a prophesized perfect being free of restriction, one who would rule over the Sith, destroy them, and remake them into something greater. Some among the Kisai interpreted this prophecy to mean that Adas himself would return, while others saw the Sitharai as a metaphorical heir of Adas. But for millennia, there was no sign that any such being was coming soon. Some Sith kings, like Dath Kagraush, came close to conquering all of the Sith splinter states, but no Sith actually managed to reunite the Kingdom of the Sith until around 7000 BBY, when Hakagram Grausch conquered all his rivals. But the younger Grausch's reign wouldn't last, for it was during his time that new outsiders would come to Korriban. While Sith were busy killing each other, the Galactic Republic grew and thrived under the watchful eye of the Jedi. The Jedi, as you surely know, rejected the use of the Dark Side, preaching that only through the light side of the Force could balance and peace be achieved. But that didn't stop some members of the Order from dabbling in the Dark Side anyway. Early in the Republic's history, in 24,500 BBY, a group called the Legion of Leto broke from the Order to study the Dark Side, sparking the First Great Schism. The Legions were crushed by the Jedi in a brief but decisive war, but thousands of years later, in 7,000 BBY, another group followed their example. These Dark Jedi also split from the Order, and at first, the Jedi Council, which was based on Ossus at the time, decided to just leave them alone. But it soon became apparent that this wasn't an option. The Dark Jedi, the Council learned, were using the Dark Side to warp life itself, raising armies of terrifying monsters that they planned to lead against the Republic. With this in mind, the Jedi Council determined that the schismatics had to be stopped. And so, the Jedi went to war, beginning the Second Great Schism in earnest. The resultant war was known as the Hundred Year Darkness, and as you might guess from the name, it lasted for a full century. Jedi Knights and their Republic allies made war against the Dark Jedi, who fought back with soul-eating leviathans and hordes of zombie soldiers. It was a bloody conflict, but in the end, the light side triumphed over the dark. 
The Hundred Year Darkness ended with the Battle of Korbos in 6900 BBY, in which the armies of the Dark Side were crushed and all but 12 Jedi were slain. The Republic wanted these 12 executed, but the Jedi refused to do so, believing that no one deserves execution. Thus, the Dark Jedi were loaded onto a galleon and shot into unknown space, with the Jedi Council hoping that they would find repentance on some remote backwater world. Instead, these exiles found Korriban. The 12 survivors from the Battle of Korbos included some of the Dark Jedi's best and brightest. There were Zozen, Marchioness of the Black Legions, and Baron Draper, the Admiral of the Dark Jedi's Warfleet. There was Sorceress Brudica, the warrior Karnes Mur, and Sorza Sin, the most powerful of the Dark Jedi Life Warpers, the self-proclaimed grower of living weapons and biological plagues. Most importantly, among the survivors was the leader of the Dark Jedi, High General Ajunta Pal, a man who killed more than a dozen Jedi back on Corbus. They called on the dark side to guide their crumbling galleon to a new home, and it brought them to Korriban, a world that, in Sorza Sin's words, screams the loudest for those who hear the dark side's call. When the exiles landed on Korriban, they were confronted by a group of local Sith who the Dark Jedi subdued with displays of force power and proto saber skill. These Gen Jedi, as the Sith called them, immediately won the respect of the Sith on Korriban. But as they attempted to learn more about the civilization they had discovered, they met resistance from Hakogram Grouch, the reigning king of the Sith. Grouch was suspicious of the outsiders, and though he tolerated their presence, he attempted to prevent them from infiltrating Sith culture, fearing that the exiles would steal the secrets of the Sith. But Grouch failed to imagine the extent of the new arrival's ambitions. After becoming acquainted with the dark side civilization they had found themselves in, the Gen Jedi were determined to conquer it for their own. With the help of Grouch's Shadow Hand, or Second in Command, they managed to infiltrate the Sith capital on Zyost, learn the beliefs and traditions of the Kisai, and undermine the existing monarchy in just a few short weeks. Once they deemed their understanding of the Sith sufficient, the exiles proclaimed themselves gods and openly challenged Hakogram Grouch. Ajunta Pal fought the Sith King in single combat and beheaded him with his own sword, after which he claimed Grouch's throne for his own. Victorious, the exiles declared themselves the lords of the Sith. Ajunta Pal, who the Kisai proclaimed the living manifestation of the Sith god Typhogem, claimed the title of Jenarai, or Dark Lord of the Sith, with Sorza Sin becoming his shadow hand. From Zyost, they quickly brought all of the Sith civilization under their rule. These new Sith Lords fused Sith magic and alchemy with Dark Jedi techniques, giving rise to an order of Darksiders that would later threaten the whole galaxy. This order became the ruling elite of a new Sith Empire, which would spread to over a hundred worlds. 6,900 years before the Battle of Yavin, the 12 Dark Jedi turned Sith Lords declared the formation of a Sith Empire, uniting all of the Sith under the leadership of Dark Lord Ajunta Pal. Immediately, they set about reshaping Sith society to suit their goals. The Sith were already warlike and divided into castes, but the new Sith Lords militarized their subjects further, commissioning the construction of vast fleets of Darafan class battleships. Sorza Sin, the shadow hand of the Empire and a skilled creator of dark side monsters, combined her techniques with those of Kisai alchemists to create ferocious Sith spawn war beasts, which the armies of the Sith would use as tanks as they expanded the borders of their empire. She formed an order of Kisai life shapers called the Ninush Wadzakut, or the Knotters of Entrails, whose work would fuel the conquests of the Sith for centuries to come. The Twelve Sith Lords formed the first Sith Council, headed by Ajunta Pal and Sorza Sin. The remaining ten Sith Lords divided the Empire between them, each claiming a swath of territory and an army of their own. They ruled as petty kings, constantly at each other's throats, but ultimately beholden to the Dark Lord of the Sith. Each put their armies to use, expanding the Sith Empire, bringing dozens of new worlds under the control of Zyost. Meanwhile, on that frigid Sith throne world, Ajunta Pal oversaw the construction of a new Sith citadel, which would be the seats of the new empire. The exiles built another fortress on Korriban in a valley steeped in the power of the dark side, 
which stemmed from an ancient Rakatan star map in the caves below. Within a few years, the Sith Lords had merged their Dark Jedi techniques and those of the Kisai into a single, coherent set of techniques and ideology. The basis for the Sith Orders of the galaxy came to fear. In those early days, however, the Sith Order was much more Kisai than Dark Jedi. Since the Dark Jedi were few in number, they had chosen to assimilate into Sith culture rather than trying to make the Sith more Dark Jedi-like, and this was reflected in their choice of weaponry. Although the Exiles had brought their proto-sabers with them to Korriban, most of them switched to using alchemically enhanced swords like the rest of the Sith, which they imbued with tremendous dark side power. Additionally, due to a general lack of alternatives, they took on Sith partners and apprentices. The alchemical techniques of Sorza's Sin allowed the Exiles to interbreed with the Sith, allowing their lineages to live on in Sith halfbreeds. The Exiles appear to have been quite prolific, as in just 2,000 years, these half-breeds were numerous enough to dominate Sith society, though they never became the majority. The Twelve Exiles ruled as Sith Lords for many years, but eventually, a schism arose between them. Some of the Sith Lords, led by Baron Draper, wanted to lead their new armies back to the Republic to resume the war with the Jedi. Ajun Sapal and the others were against this course of action, as they didn't believe the Sith Empire was strong enough yet, but Draper and his followers set out with a war fleet anyway, never to return. They seem to have been destroyed by the First Republic fleet they encountered, accomplishing little apart from informing the Republic of the existence of a Sith Empire out in unknown space. Soon afterwards, the Sith lost the roots back to the Republic, and they would make no further attempts at revenge for 2,000 years. The loss of Draper and his followers left seats on the Sith Council open, which, for a time, were filled by Sith purebloods, as the Sith species would soon be known. These successors had been trained as apprentices by the Sith Lords, and they would go on to train apprentices of their own, allowing the techniques of the Sith Order to spread across the Empire. It wouldn't take long for the seats of the remaining exiles to be filled by second generation Sith Lords as well. As the exiles grew older, they spent increasing amounts of time in their fortress on Korriban, reveling in the dark side power of the star map. There, they began to grow suspicious of each other, and this ultimately led to plots, assassinations, and infighting. Eventually, a battle broke out in the Korriban fortress that caused the whole structure to collapse, killing Ajun Sapal and the remaining exiles. The first Sith Lords had destroyed each other. They were laid to rest in elaborate tombs on Korriban, Ajunta Pal's tomb was the largest, built in the very valley where the exiles made their fortress, the first of many tombs in what would be known as the Valley of the Dark Lords. For centuries, the Sith Empire steadily expanded, becoming stronger and wealthier, ruled by a mix of purebloods and halfbreeds. In this time, it was regularly hampered by infighting on the Sith Council, which stimmed the Empire's expansion and wasted its strength in many small civil wars. The result was an endless cycle of growth and infighting which persisted until around 6000 BBY when the Dark Lord Tulak Horde came to power. Known to history as the Lord of Hate and Master of the Gathering Darkness, Tulak Horde was one of, if not the most powerful of the ancient Sith Lords. He was skilled in many rare dark side techniques, most notably an obscure Sith ritual that allowed him to feed off the power of his enemies during battle. Horde was also a brilliant tactician and a ruthless conqueror, but he was perhaps most known for his skill in lightsaber combat. Tulak Horde was one of only a few ancient Sith Lords that preferred a lightsaber to an alchemically enhanced sword, and he was by far the greatest lightsaber duelist of the ancient Sith, pioneering techniques that the Sith would use for millennia. When he became Dark Lord of the Sith, Tulak Horde began a campaign of conquest that more than doubled the size of the Sith Empire. With his loyal Dash Aid servant Kem Val at his side, he crushed opponents on more than a hundred worlds, quashing rebellions on Yun and Chabosh and growing the Sith Empire to encompass over 120 worlds. He likely would have expanded further were it not for the Stygian Caldera, a ring of nebulae that surrounded Sith space, isolating it from the outside galaxy. The Caldera functioned as a hyperspace breakwater, making it all but impossible for the Sith Empire to expand beyond it. 
The ancient Sith were only able to establish major settlements on three worlds outside the Caldera. These were Thule, which lay just on the other side of the nebula on the edge of the Radama Void, Malachor V, which became home to an extremist cult known to history as the True Sith, and Tund, a remote world to which the Sith had sent heretics for millennia. The bulk of Sith society remained within the Caldera, which became a densely populated region divided between the ten Sith fiefdoms. Apart from the capital of Zyost and the holy world of Korriban, important planets in the Sith Empire included Koriz, Athis, Svoltsen, Bargeba, and Folgai, rimwood of Zyost, Niska, Relg, Kardelba, Kreis, and Chodos in a loop between Zyost and Korriban, and Begeren, Kalsonor, Ashasri, Jaguada, Dramundkas, and Bosterda in the heart of Sith space. For decades, Tulakord ruled all these worlds with an iron fist. Ever suspicious of challenges to his power, he kept many of his techniques secret, regularly assassinated potential rivals, and trained only one apprentice, Orton Seller. However, despite Horde's best efforts, he was ultimately betrayed and killed by his own apprentice, who attempted to usurp the title of Dark Lord of the Sith. Due to Horde's ironclad grip on power, his death left a massive power vacuum sparking yet another long period of infighting in which the strength of the Sith was wasted in civil wars. Even as the great Tulak Horde was laid to rest in the Valley of the Dark Lords, his accomplishments were undermined by those clamoring to be his successors. The constant cycle of growth and infighting resumed and lasted for several more centuries. Due to the Stygian Caldera, however, the Sith Empire's expansion was greatly limited, leading to more infighting than growth between 6000 and 5100 BBY. It took another great Sith Lord to bring this chaos to an end. This Sith Lord was Marka Ragnos, an immensely powerful Sith half-breed known for his burly build and political cunning. He had used manipulation and force in equal measure during his rise through the Sith ranks, and his skill was such that, when the reigning Sith Lord died in 5100 BBY, Ragnos was one of two candidates to replace him. The other was a Sith Lord named Simus, who fought a duel with Marka Ragnos for rule of the Sith Empire. Ragnos won, but through arcane Sith techniques, Simus survived, albeit as a disembodied head. Despite his survival, Simus conceded to Ragnos, allowing him to become Dark Lord of the Sith. In exchange, Ragnos had a glass case created to keep Simus alive and allowed him to stay on the Sith Council, where Simus became greatly respected for his wisdom. Marka Ragnos reigned for a hundred years, and like the Dark Lords before him, he ruled with an iron fist. This period was known as the Golden Age of the Sith. For under Marka Ragnos, the Sith Empire experienced unprecedented prosperity. Ragnos kept the Empire stable by pitting would-be usurpers and troublemakers against each other, allowing them to harmlessly destroy themselves without weakening the Empire as a whole. In this manner, Ragnos also eliminated all threats to his rule, much as Tulak Horde had. The Golden Age of the Sith lasted until 5000 BBY when Marka Ragnos died, apparently of natural causes. With his death, two new Sith Lords eyed the throne on Zyost, each of them with very different visions for the Sith Empire. One was the conservative Ludo Kresh, who was cautious and sought to preserve the strength of the Sith. The other was Naga Sadal, an expansionist who wanted to begin a new age of conquest. They didn't even wait for Marka Ragnos' tomb in Korriban's Valley of the Dark Lords to be sealed before drawing their swords on each other. But their battle for control of the Empire was brought to a sudden stop by the appearance of Ragnos' spectre. The ghost reminded Kresh and Sadal of the history of the Sith Empire and warned that the future of the Sith was uncertain. A time of great change was at hand. What he meant soon became apparent, for even as this spectre vanished, for the first time in nearly 2,000 years, an alien starship appeared in the skies above Korriban. 5,000 years before the Battle of Yavin, the Sith Empire was at a crossroads. It was wealthy and powerful, and its rule over the Sith worlds was absolute. But thanks to the Stygian Caldera, the ring of nebulae that surrounded Sith space, it was unable to expand and it had grown stagnant. Some of the Sith Lords were content to continue business as usual, to enjoy the stability Marka Ragnos had given them, but others were growing eager to expand, to seek new territories to conquer beyond the Caldera. The former faction was led by Ludo Kresh, the Lord of Relg, 
one of the oldest and most important worlds in the empire. Kresh was a traditionalist, and he feared that a new age of expansion could bring ruin to the empire, inviting invasions from enemies not even the Sith could hope to defeat. Kresh was one of the most powerful lords on the Sith Council, and he would have been a lock for the title of Dark Lord of the Sith were it not for Naga Sadow, his equally powerful rival. Sadow was the leader of the Sith's expansionist faction. He believed the Empire had to either expand or die, and he saw Kresh's conservatism as cowardly complacency. Sadow's seat of power was the frigid planet Kardelba, and while Kresh was a favorite of the Kisai priests, Sadow was a populist, an unusual trait for an ancient Sith Lord, winning him the loyalty of the Masasi warrior caste. Kresh and Sadow didn't even wait for Marka Ragnos to be buried to begin their contest for the throne on Zyos. Kresh snubbed Sadow by starting the funeral without him, and the tomb doors had barely been closed before the two drew their swords and fought. But their battle was interrupted by the spectre of Ragnos himself, who reminded the two of the history of the Sith Empire and warned that a time of great change was at hand. What he meant soon became apparent as an alien ship appeared in the skies above Korriban. This ship was a small hyperspace scouting vessel known to history as Starbreaker 12. It landed right in the middle of the Valley of the Dark Lords, much as the ship of the exiled Dark Jedi had 2,000 years earlier. Its landing doors opened and out walked two young humans, a man and a woman who claimed to come in peace from the Galactic Republic. Their names were Gav and Jory Darragon, brother and sister hyperspace explorers from the Koro system in the Deep Core. They had fled poverty and trouble with bounty hunters aboard their scout ship, and thanks to their untrained force sensitivity, they had made a blind jump all the way from Koros Major to Korriban, from the Deep Core to the Outer Rim. In doing so, they changed the course of galactic history. The Darragon siblings were taken prisoner by the untrusting Sith the moment they stepped off their ship, and the Sith Lords immediately split on what to do with them. Ludo Kresh wanted them executed immediately, fearing that they were the vanguard of a Republic invasion. Naga Sadao, however, hoped that they could be used to lead the armies of the Sith back to Republic space, where there were thousands of new worlds to conquer. The Darragons were imprisoned in the Sith Citadel on Zyost, while the Sith Lords debated in the council chambers above. Sadao made an impassioned plea for the assembled Lords to seize the opportunity that had presented itself, but ultimately, the council sided with Ludo Kresh. The Darragons were to be executed. But Naga Sadao was unwilling to let Kresh have the last word. He had some of his Masasi steal a set of blasters from the Starbreaker 12 and use them to raid the Citadel's dungeons, freeing the Darragons and making the whole thing look like a Republic attack. To top it all off, Sadao murdered the Sith Lord Simus, his own mentor, with one of the blasters, hoping that it would be enough to convince the other lords to join him in war with the Republic. Sadao had the Darragons brought back to Kardelba, and then he returned to the council chambers as news of the attack arrived, feigning ignorance. Shaken by the suddenness and ferocity of the attack, the Sith Council voted to make Naga Sadao the new Dark Lord, eager for revenge on the Republic. But Ludo Kresh refused to accept Sadao's victory. Two of the other Sith Lords, Horak Mul and Dor Gal Ram, still secretly supported him, and Kresh had them quietly gather their fleets at his stronghold on Relk. As Naga Sadao returned to Kardelba to prepare his own fleet for the coming war, Kresh and his allies attacked, bombarding Sadao's forces from orbit. But they had fallen into a trap. Sadao's fortress on Kardelba was a decoy. His true stronghold was hidden in a crater on the dark side of Karshian. Kardelba's moon, and he had rallied the bulk of his fleet there. As Kresh, Galram, and Horak Mul pressed the attack, Sadao's fleet attacked them from behind. The Dark Lord then struck the most devastating blow of all. On his command, the Masasi crew of Gamram and Horak Mul's fleets rose up and murdered their lords, taking control of their ships for Naga Sadao. Ludo Kresh was forced to retreat. Now unopposed, Sadao ordered all the military forces of the Sith Empire to rally at Chodos, the stronghold of Shah Dakan, 
Sadao's closest ally on the council. He planted a tracking device on the Starbreaker 12 and then allowed Jory Darragon to escape back to the Republic while he kept Gav with him. Sadao had started to train Gav in Sith techniques, hoping to shape him into an apprentice. He preyed on Gav's resentment over the poverty he and his sister had endured back in the Republic, promising to free the galaxy from the tyranny of the Senate. As a sign of trust in the naive young man, Sadao assigned Gav command of one of his war fleets, promising him the honor of liberating his home system from the Republic. Before long, every fleet in the Sith Empire had been assembled, and Sadao declared that the time had come. The fleets of the Sith jumped to hyperspace, following the Darragon's route back to the Republic. This route took them right into the galaxy's heart, giving the Sith a clear shot at Coruscant itself. Upon exiting hyperspace, Sadao didn't waste any time. He divided up his massive armada and ordered his fleet commanders to launch attacks all over the Republic, hoping to catch the Republic Navy and the Jedi off guard. The two greatest Sith fleets were led by Gav Darragon and Shah Dakan, intended for the Koro system and Coruscant, respectively. On Gav Darragon's command, the vanguard of Sadao's fleet split up and attacked each of the seven worlds of the Koro system, with the largest assigned to Koros Major. While Gav's fleet kept Republic forces in the Koros system occupied, Shah Dakan led the rest of the armada up the Koros trunk line to Coruscant. There, Dakan led an all-out assault on the galactic capital, while other Sith fleets spread out from Coruscant, attacking Thorost, Metalos, Basilisk, Ixlar, Shulkin, and Thokos. Other Sith fleets spread further across the Republic, attacking numerous worlds and causing tremendous amounts of chaos. So began the Great Hyperspace War of 5000 BBY, the first true galactic scale war since the formation of the Republic. As Sadao had hoped, the Sith caught the Republic Navy by surprise, allowing them to make major headway. Within hours, Sadao seemed poised to capture the core. Even on Coruscant, where the Republic's greatest fleet and a small army of Jedi Knights was gathered, the Sith had the advantage. Shah Dakan led seemingly endless armies of Masasi and war beasts against the Senate Hall itself. While thousands of Sith battleships and missile frigates rained death and destruction from above, deploying new drop pods of ground troops all the while. But not everything was going according to Sadao's plan. One Jedi Knight, Odan Ur, had foreseen the impending Sith assault in a dream. He tried to warn the Senate to no avail, but he ultimately succeeded in rallying the Jedi. Additionally, Empress Teta, the ruler of the Koro system, believed Odan Ur's warnings and had prepared a great war fleet in her home system in advance. Thus, even as the Sith swept across the heart of the Core Worlds, they found the Koro system a harder target than anticipated. On top of this, Gav Darragon abandoned his command post in the middle of the battle, traveling down to the city of Sinegar and Koros Major to find his sister. There, after a confrontation with Jory and glimpses of the damage the Sith attack had done to the city, Gav realized that Naga Sadao cared nothing about liberating the galaxy from Republican justice, and that had been tricked. Gav fled back to his command ship, which he took to the nearby unstable red supergiant Primus Golud. Above Primus Golud, Naga Sadao had set up his command ship, a Sith meditation sphere. This unusual craft was designed to channel the power of arcane Sith rituals, broadcasting Naga Sadao's Sith magic across hyperspace. There, Naga Sadao had been coordinating the entire Sith war effort and bolstering its strength via obscure Sith techniques. Hoping to break Sadao's concentration, Gav fired on the meditation sphere and, in an instant, much of the Sith Empire's armies vanished. As it turned out, most of Sadao's fleet had been composed of illusions conjured up by Sadao's arcane rituals. Once the illusions disappeared, it became apparent that the Sith had overextended themselves and were, in fact, badly outnumbered. The Republic Navy led a counterattack against Sith forces from Anaxus, while the Jedi rallied the defenders of Coruscant and the other beleaguered Republic worlds. One by one, the Sith fleets began to retreat in disarray. Shah Dakan was forced to abandon the assault on Coruscant, and thanks to the sacrifice of Jedi Master Uru, 
Sith forces were driven from the Koro system as well. They all fell back to Primus Golud. Empress Teta's fleets, with Jory Darragon in tow, pursued them, and Nagasadao realized that his gambit had failed. He reached out to Gav and challenged him to a final battle aboard the Meditation Sphere, only to sabotage the ship and retreat to one of his battleships as Gav boarded. Sadao took command of his secondary flagship, the battleship Corsair, and left Gav trapped on the Meditation Sphere. Aboard the Corsair, Sadao used a powerful dark side weapon to destabilize Primus Golud's core, hoping to use the resultant supernova to kill Gav and cover the retreat of his armada back to the Sith Empire. But Gav sent Empress Teta to the coordinates of the Darragon Trail before he was killed by the explosion, and the Republic fleet followed Sadao home. The tattered remains of Sadao's invasion force regrouped above Korriban, only to find another Sith fleet waiting for them. This fleet was under the command of none other than Ludo Kresh, who, in Sadao's absence, had claimed the title of Dark Lord of the Sith and taken control of Zyost. Beside himself with fury, Naga Sadao ordered what remained of his forces to engage Kresh's fleet. Above Korriban, what remained of the military might of the Sith Empire destroyed itself. Sadao's ships were ultimately able to destroy Ludo Kresh's flagship, killing the would-be Dark Lord and scattering his remaining followers. But the battle had only just ended when Empress Teta arrived in system with a fleet of Republic warships, which immediately opened fire on Sadao's remaining vessels. Sensing that his fleet was doomed, Sadao ordered the Masasi on his remaining ships to take command and fight to the death. They did so, covering the Dark Lord while he fled Sith space aboard the Corsair. Republic ships pursued, but Sadao managed to lose them in the Denari system, and he and his Masasi ultimately settled on a hereto unknown jungle moon far from Republic space. There, on the fourth moon of Yavin, Sadao hoped to wait out the storm even as the rest of the Sith Empire fell to ruin. The Great Hyperspace War ended with the Battle of Korriban, in which the forces of Naga Sadao destroyed Ludo Kresh and his followers, but were then wiped off the map by Empress Teta. But Supreme Chancellor Poltimo of the Galactic Senate was unwilling to let things end there. He ordered the mobilization of the entire Republic Navy for a full-scale invasion of Sith space. Accompanied by the Jedi, the forces of the Republic were ordered to completely dismantle the Sith Empire. The invasion couldn't have come at a worse time for the Sith. They barely had a fleet left to defend their skies with, and many Masasi Sith adepts and war beasts had died in the Great Hyperspace War. Ludo Kresh was dead, as were many other Sith Lords, and Naga Sadao had vanished. As we discussed in the last episode, he had fled to Yavin 4, though a tomb in the Valley of the Dark Lords was still sealed in his honor. Sith Lord Shah Darkhan, who had been Naga Sadao's second in command, became acting Dark Lord of the Sith, but he proved unable to rally the remaining forces of the doomed Sith Empire. As the Republic invasion began, Shah Darkhan ordered the Masasi to fight to the last man, which held the Republic back for a time and allowed many factions of the Sith to flee the Sith Empire entirely. But before long, the might of the Republic and the Jedi proved too much even for the blind battle fury of the Masasi. After a few years of fighting, the Sith Empire ceased to exist, and virtually all of the Sith worlds were rendered depopulated ruins. Neither the Republic nor the Jedi carried out a genocide of the Sith, as is sometimes claimed, but nonetheless, the campaign all but eradicated the Sith purebloods. Those Sith who didn't fight to the death killed themselves in mass ritual suicides, depopulating their homeworlds one by one. By the time the Republic had won, it seemed that there wasn't a single Sith left alive in the entire Empire. Zyos, Korriban, and many other worlds were left desolate, home only to beasts and the crumbling ruins of the once mighty Sith Empire. Many Sith remnants escaped this bloodbath, however. Some Sith fled to distant Tund, a world the Dark Lords had used as a prison for heretics, while others fled to Thul, a Sith fortress world home to a community of elite Masasi 
just outside the Stygian Caldera. Others still regrouped on the acidic Republic world Vujun, where they intermarried with local human aristocrats and secretly passed Sith teachings onto new generations. Nargisadau, as we mentioned last episode, retreated to Yavin 4 with a ship full of Masasi warriors, and there was evidence that another, more radical faction of the Sith had gathered large numbers of Sith purebloods at Malachor 5 before fleeing into the unknown regions. Despite the existence of these many holdouts, the Republic and the Jedi Order had nonetheless dealt a near fatal blow to the Sith. Their empire was gone, their base of power was shattered, and many of their teachings and artifacts were lost thanks to the Jedi Shadows, who combed the ruins of Sith worlds for any trace of the Sith teachings. The Jedi destroyed a great deal, hoping to prevent future Darksiders from learning the ways of the Sith, though they also preserved many holocrons and scrolls in the vaults of the Great Library on Ossus and the Galactic Museum on Coruscant. But though Jedi were able to all but vanquish the Sith, the Dark Side wouldn't remain dormant forever. Some of the Sith holdouts planned an immediate counterattack against the Republic, with the most notable being the one masterminded by Ludo Kresh's son, Elcho. Having built a fleet of pirates and mercenaries, Kresh the Younger sought revenge against the Republic, but the night before the attack was to begin, he partied too hard and died of a ruptured stomach, and his followers abandoned the attempt. The other Sith were smart enough to realize that they would be unable to get their revenge anytime soon, and so instead they opted to bide their time, waiting for what they saw as the inevitable resurgence of the dark side. They waited for centuries, and in this time, some of the Sith remnants dissolved, as happened on Vajun and Tund. But on Thul and Yavin 4, the Masasi and their remaining leaders waited patiently for their chance at revenge. On Yavin, where the Dark Lord of the Sith himself still lived, Nargisadau's followers built great temples in the forest, where their master spent years continuing his studies into Sith alchemy. After several decades of this, Sadao ended up placing himself into suspended animation, vowing to awaken when the dark side had returned. Naga Sadao slept for over 500 years, until a young Jedi named Frieden Nad arrived on Yavin. Frieden Nad was a prodigy. Early in his training, the Jedi Masters on Ossus recognized that he was incredibly strong in the Force, more so than any other student they had seen for centuries. Nad had a gift, and he knew it, dreaming of becoming the greatest Jedi that had ever lived. But the Jedi Masters saw his pride, and they refused to make Nad a Jedi Knight until he learned humility. Frieden Nad was outraged by this, and in his arrogance, he believed the Jedi were deliberately holding him back for fear of his power. In a fit of rage, he killed his master and abandoned the Order. Still furious at the Jedi, Frieden Nad vowed to learn the ways of the Sith out of spite. He traveled to the ruins of Sith space, and on the Sith world Ashas Re, he discovered an artifact that the Jedi had missed, the holocron of the ancient King Adas. Nad learned much of the dark side from Adas's holocron, and in Sith space, he also found clues that led him to Yavin 4. Nad traveled to the forest moon, where he was attacked on sight by the Masasi. However, Nad was able to hold his own, and the Masasi eventually relented, allowing him to access their temples. There, Nad discovered and awakened Naga Sadao, who took the young dark Jedi as an apprentice. Naga Sadao taught Frieden Nad everything he knew, and Nad spent years on Yavin 4 learning from the Dark Lord. Eventually, however, Sadao had nothing left to teach Nad, and so the Dark Jedi killed his master, usurping the title of Dark Lord of the Sith. Frieden Nad abandoned Yavin and returned to Republic space, looking for a world of his own to conquer. Ultimately, he settled on Onderon. Onderon was a jungle world dominated by vicious beasts home to only a single settlement, the walled city of Aziz. The city had been built by a group of human settlers that had crashed on the planet, who had been forced to stick together to survive the dangers of the jungles. Centuries later, even after Aziz had blossomed into a fully-fledged civilization, 
the city was still an island of safety on a wild world. 4,400 years before the Battle of Yavin, using the power of the dark side and the promise of more advanced technology, Fridanad conquered Aziz, overthrowing the existing government and setting himself up as an absolute monarch. Fridanad's reign as king of Aziz was long and brutal. He transformed Onderonian society, deeply embedding Sith teachings and ideology into the planet's culture and national consciousness, allowing him to keep the people of Aziz in line despite his brutality. All those who dared resist Freed and Nad were cast out of Aziz to fend for themselves in the jungles. This was deemed the same as a death sentence on Aziz, but some of these exiled rebels managed to survive by taming Onderon's ferocious beasts. They became the Beast Riders, a rival society that opposed the Sith and the Dark Side, and they waged war against Aziz. The conflict between the Nardists and the Beast Riders lasted for decades, and the situation on the planet worsened until finally, after more than a century of Nad's tyranny, the Jedi caught wind of what was happening on Onderon and intervened. In the pitched battle that followed, many Jedi were slain, but in the end, Freed and Nad, King of Aziz and Dark Lord of the Sith, was defeated. The death of Freed and Nad ended an unbroken chain of Dark Lords of the Sith that had been maintained since Ajunta Pal and the Jedi believed that it would mean the end of the Dark Side's influence on Onderon. But the threat of Freed and Nad didn't end with his death. Nad's spirit lived on, and in the ensuing centuries, it continued to exert influence over Aziz. Subsequent Onderonian monarchs were directly descended from Nad, and they continued to serve the Dark Side in secret, guided by the specter of their dead ancestor. Aziz, as a whole, remained dominated by Nadist ideology and practices, though the Onderonians kept this a secret. It was during this period after the death of Freed and Nad that the Dark Side steadily began to rise again in the Greater Galaxy. In 4250 BBY, there was even a third Great Schism in the Jedi Order, though this conflict was resolved quickly as the Dark Jedi all accidentally destroyed themselves and an entire star system in the Volta Cataclysm that same year. But Onderon remained the heart of this new rising tide of darkness, and in 4000 BBY, it laid the groundwork for the resurgence of the Sith. The Jedi and the Republic were unaware of the continued rule of the Nadists, but the Beast Riders were not. They continued their wars with Aziz, seeking to unseat Nad's descendants. By 4000 BBY, the Beast Wars of Onderon had intensified to such a point that Queen Aminoa, despite being a Nadist, requested Jedi intervention painting the Beast Riders as lawless raiders preying on an innocent civilization. Jedi Master Arka Jeth dispatched a team of apprentices led by Ulic Keldroma to help resolve the conflict, and the Jedi initially bought into Aminoa's story, especially after her daughter, Princess Galia, was abducted by the Beast Riders. But when the Jedi tried to rescue Galia, they learned the truth of the situation. Galia, it turned out, had willingly defected to the Beast Riders, she planned to marry Oron Kira, the Beast Rider's own prince, and then overthrow her Nardist mother. The Jedi ultimately agreed to help the Beast Riders overthrow Aminoa, and with the last minute help of Arka Jeth, they were successful. Aminoa was slain, and Galia and Oron Kira became the new monarchs of Onderon. But not even this was enough to drive the dark side from Onderon. Two years later, the Jedi attempted to relocate the Sacrifagia of Freed and Nad and Queen Aminoa to Duxin, Onderon's fourth moon, only to be met with a mass uprising of Nardists in Aziz. Led by King Omen, Aminoa's presumed dead husband, and the Dark Jedi Wab Null, the Nardists took back the Sacrifagi and attempted to recapture Aziz. However, the Jedi called in support from the Republic and the rest of the Order, allowing them to put down the Nardist revolt. Warb Null was slain by Ulic Keldrema, who refused to grant the Dark Jedi mercy after defeating him, and in the end, King Omen was slain as well. Their spirits, and that of Freed and Nad, were all banished to Duxin. But during the Nardist revolt, two visitors had managed to slip into Aziz, hoping to meet with King Omen. They were cousins Satal and Ali Makito, both aristocrats from Chorus Major in the recently renamed Empress Teta system. They were also the leaders of a dark side cult called the Kroth, and they revered the Sith. 
collecting all the Sith lore and artifacts they could get their hands on. Both were gifted with the Force, and they sought to learn Sith techniques from Omen. The spirit of Frida Nad saw great potential in the young Force adepts, and he instructed Omen to give them a bunch of Sith scrolls and artifacts, including a powerful amulet that had once belonged to Naga Sadal. Nad helped the cousins escape Aziz before his banishment by the Jedi. Even as Onderon was freed from the dark side's grip, the Kitos returned to their home system. There, they and their Krath followers learned many ancient Sith techniques from the scrolls they had taken on Onderon. The dark side was still only growing stronger, and it wouldn't be long before the Dark Lords of the Sith returned. 4,000 years before the Battle of Yavin, Queen Aminoa of Aziz, a descendant and acolyte of the Sith Lord Freedon Nad, was overthrown by a coalition of Onderon's beast riders and the Jedi Knights. Two years later, her husband, fellow Darksider King Omen, was also defeated and with him, the last remnants of the Onderonian Nadists were destroyed. Jedi Master Arka Jeth had the remains of Nad and his descendants moved to a tomb on Duxon, Onderon's demon moon, and the Spectre of the Sith was banished from Onderon. But before the defeat of the Nardists, a pair of young aristocrats from the Empress Teta system had met with King Omen and encountered the spirit of Freedon Nad, who had given them an ancient Sith amulet and a book of Sith lore. These two cousins, Satal and Ali Makito, escaped the final battle of the Nardist uprising, and through them, Freedon Nad's legacy survived. In the Great Hyperspace War, the warrior queen for whom the Empress Teta system was named was instrumental in the defeat of the Sith Empire. Her descendants ruled over the seven worlds of the system for the next thousand years, growing incredibly wealthy through collaboration with the system's carbonite mining guilds. In 4000 BBY, the system was ruled by the Lord and Lady Kito, the parents of Satal Kito. Satal and his cousin Alima lived lives of luxury and idleness and in their boredom and privilege, they developed a fascination with the dark side and the Sith. They and their fellow rich youngsters ended up forming a secret society they called the Krath, a dark side cult that worshipped the Sith in secret, named after an evil trickster god from Tetan mythology. But in 3998 BBY, what started as a game among bored rich 20-somethings became deadly serious. With the help of Fridanad's gifts, Satal and Alima, both of whom were Force-sensitive, began learning Sith techniques, and they were rapidly corrupted by the power of the Dark Side. Alima became highly skilled in Sith sorcery, while Satal began organizing a base of political power for the Krath using the teachings of Fridanad. Then, in 3997 BBY, the Krath launched a coup. With Alima's powers of illusion and military backing secured by Satal, the young aristocrats overthrew their parents and murdered them by dipping them in molten carbonite. The young Ketos and their friends then seized control of the Seven Worlds one by one, withdrawing the Empress Teta system from the Republic. The Krath quickly assembled an army of loyalists, gathering Force sensitives from across the Seven Worlds and training them in Sith techniques. These new dark side adepts, most notably including the Krath Death Witches, were backed by the full force of the Tetan military, which was thoroughly corrupted between Satal's influence and Alima's magic. Sith influence turned the Tetan soldiers into fanatical Krath loyalists, willing to die in kamikaze attacks for their new overlords. The Kitos used their fanaticism to conquer six of the seven worlds in a matter of weeks, leaving only Koros Major. A joint Jedi Republic task force led by Ulik Keldroma and fellow Jedi Knight Nomi Sunrider attempted to intervene to save Koros Major from the final Krath assault, but they were driven off by swarms of Krath Chaos fighters. Koros Major fell soon after, and the Kiddos seized the Iron Citadel in the city of Sinagar as their new stronghold. The rise of the Krath greatly troubled the Jedi who feared that a resurgence of the dark side was at hand. These fears, of course, were correct, and it wasn't only the Krath who were bringing the dark side back to the galaxy. Around the same time, the young Jedi Knight Exar Kun, a student of Master Vodo Siosk Bask of Dantooine, 
had also developed a fascination with the Sith. Kun was an arrogant but extremely powerful Jedi who sought to understand the dark side so as to be able to defeat it. His master and fellow apprentices warned him against the study of the Sith, fearing that he would be lost to the temptations of the dark side. But Kun refused to listen, and he left Dantooine to seek out the legacy of the Sith. He travelled first to Onderon, posing as a Jedi archaeologist, where Master Arka immediately sensed his true intentions and told him to piss off. But Kun proceeded to Aziz anyway, where he met two artists who showed him Frida Nad's tomb on Duxon. Inside the tomb, Kun came face to face with the ghost of Frida Nad himself, who offered to share the secrets of the Sith with the young Jedi. Nad helped Kun find a pair of Sith scrolls hidden in his sarcophagus, which contained star charts leading to Korriban. Eager to learn more about the Sith, Exar Kun travelled to their ancient homeworld, to the Valley of the Dark Lords. The ghost of Frida Nad accompanied him, and while Kun was exploring the tomb of Marka Ragnos, Nad engineered a cave-in, trapping the young Jedi in the tomb and burying him under a pile of boulders, shattering his skeleton. Afraid to die, Kun attempted to call on the light side of the Force to heal him, but the darkness of Korriban prevented him from doing so. At Frida Nad's urging, Kun instead drew on the dark side to heal himself, turning his anger and hatred for Nad into power. When Kun again used the dark side to escape the tomb, the spirits of the ancient Sith told Nad that the young Jedi was ready for the next step. Nad then led Kun to Yavin 4, where he was overcome by the Masasi, who had continued to occupy the jungle moon's temples after the death of their master, Naga Sadao. The Masasi attempted to sacrifice Kun to one of Sadao's Sith spawn creations, but Nad helped Kun defeat the beast by claiming Sadao's Sith amulet, which channeled Kun's anger to form destructive beams of energy. With the beast dead, the Masasi began worshipping Exar Kun, who, with Nad's urging, cast aside the mantle of the Jedi and accepted the legacy of the Sith. Unwilling to share his newfound power, Kun then used Sadao's gauntlet to destroy Frida Nad's spirit, subjecting the Dark Lord to a second death. While Exar Kun conquered the Masasi, the craft declared war on the Jedi Order in retaliation for the intervention at Koros Major. In response, the Order called a conclave on Deneba, gathering all the Jedi in the galaxy to discuss what to do next. Many Jedi proposed meeting the Kroth in battle, but Ulik Keldroma proposed a different approach. He feared that outright force would fail to completely destroy the teachings of the Sith, and so he proposed the Jedi to send a spy to infiltrate the Kroth and destroy them from within. Many of the Jedi at the Conclave were horrified by this proposal, but before an alternative plan could be proposed, the Assembly came under attack. A ship above Deneba deployed drop pods containing dozens of vicious Kroth war droids, which attacked the gathered Jedi with unrestrained ferocity. Due to the surprise nature of the attack, many Jedi were slain, including Master Arka. The Kroth droids were quickly defeated, but the death of his master crushed Ulik Kaldroma, who blamed himself for failing to save Arka. In the aftermath of the attack, Keldroma decided to go through his plan without the Council's assent. His brother, Kay, and his close friend Nomi Sunrider urged him not to, but Keldroma refused to listen and travelled to Sinegar, posing as a fallen Jedi looking to defect to the Kroth. The Kitos saw through this pretty quickly, but Alima nonetheless refused to have Keldroma killed, hoping to make Ulik's ruse into reality. But Keldroma's mission was thrown sideways when Nomi deliberately let herself get captured by the Kroth, hoping to convince Ulik to leave Sinegar. Ulik helped her escape Kroth's dungeons, but he refused to abandon the mission. However, during Nomi's escape, Ulik was forced to confront Satal Kito, who taunted the young Jedi with the revelation that he had ordered the attack on Deneba. Enraged, Ulik killed Satal in cold blood. The Kroth tyrant died laughing, sensing that he had pushed Keldroma toward the dark side. Despite his killing of Satal, Alima still let Ulik walk free in the Iron Citadel, and even gave the young Jedi Satal's Sith amulet. Around this time, 
The two also began a physical relationship, which Alima used to draw Keldroma even closer toward the dark side. Nomi and the Jedi Task Force launched an attack on Sinagar a few weeks later, making one last attempt to extract Ulik. But once more, Keldroma refused to leave. By that point, he was in the grip of the dark side, and he knew that he could no longer turn back. Meanwhile, Exar Kun had settled in as the undisputed ruler of Yavin 4's Masasi, who built new temples across the jungle moon in his honor. As his new servants built, Kun immersed himself in the lore kept by Naga Sidao, learning just about everything there was to know about the Sith and the dark side. As part of his studies and his explorations of the Masasi temples, he discovered the Corsair, the battleship that Naga Sidao came to Yavin 4 on. He had the ship reactivated and made space worthy again, as he intended to leave Yavin to tie up loose ends. By this point, Kun was aware of the rise of the Krath, and he saw these fellow disciples of Frida Nad as a threat to his power. Hoping to eliminate the Kido cousins, he and a small contingent of Masasi traveled to Sinagar, arriving in the middle of the second Jedi attack. Kun used the Jedi attack as cover to infiltrate the Iron Citadel, and when the strike team left the system, he stepped out and confronted Ali Makito and Ulik Keldroma. Kun and Keldroma drew their lightsabers and fought, but as they battled, a strange thing happened. The Sith amulets that the two men wore began to interact. They had both belonged to Naga Sadao, and they were both part of the same set. As the amulets interfaced with each other, Kun and Keldroma shared a sudden vision of the ancient Sith on Korriban, who ordered them to stop fighting. The long dead Dark Lord Marka Ragnos addressed the two men from a thousand years in the past, identifying them as beings of Sith prophecy. They were destined to be Sith Lords, Ragnos claimed, and among the greatest to ever hold the title. The spirit of Ragnos branded each of the Dark Jedi on the forehead, giving them unique Sith markings as the Dark Lords of old had. He anointed Exar Kun as the new Dark Lord of the Sith, stating that, because of him, the Sith would never die, and he proclaimed Ulik Keldroma Kun's first and foremost apprentice. Then the vision faded. As Ali Makito watched, Exar Kun and Ulik Keldroma pledged to join forces, and together they vowed to bring down the galaxy. After a thousand years, the Dark Lords of the Sith had returned. Under Exar Kun and Ulik Keldroma, the Sith would take on a new form, and they would make their presence known in the most devastating war the galaxy had ever seen. In 3997 BBY, Exar Kun and Ulik Keldroma allied in the Iron Citadel on Koros Major, with Kun becoming the Dark Lord of the Sith and Keldroma his foremost apprentice. They vowed to work together to bring down the galaxy to forge a new Sith Empire and usher in a new Golden Age of the Sith. But they didn't begin their Great Crusade immediately. Kun's Masasi and Keldroma's Krath were insufficient to take on the Republic alone. Both Sith Lords knew that they still needed more followers. Exar Kun secretly rallied the other remnants of the Sith, rallying the holdouts on Thul and Vajun, and recruiting the assassins of the Makrosa Order. The Makrosa seized control of the Tapani sector, including the shipyards of Fondor, expanding the fleets of the Sith, while Kun and his Sith loyalists resettled many of the lost Sith worlds, building the spaceport city of Dreshde on Korriban. But Exar Kun wasn't overly concerned with these acquisitions. He wanted to recruit Jedi to his cause, hoping to undermine the Order from within. Ulik Keldroma, meanwhile, came into contact with invaders from the edge of Republic space, the Mandalorian Crusaders. For decades, the Mandalorians had been harassing targets throughout the Republic's northern dependencies, led by the ruthless Mandalore the Indomitable. In a few years before the rise of the Krath, Mandalore and his crusaders had even pierced the borders of the Core Worlds, devastating Basilisk and setting up camp on Kua in the Deep Core, close to the borders of Krath space. As Keldroma rallied the armies of the Empress Teta system, the Mandalorians began attacking Krath patrols, looking for a new target to pillage. 
Keldroma faced Mandalore in single combat on Kua and emerged victorious, winning the Warlord's allegiance. The Mandalorian Crusaders joined forces with the Kroth, and Keldroma, Alima Kito, and Mandalore led them in a series of raids on Vital Republic shipyards, attacking Foros and Vento with unrestrained ferocity. In the process, they captured hundreds of Republic ships, amassing a fleet that Keldroma deemed large enough for the war with the Republic. Meanwhile, Exarchon returned to the Jedi homeworld of Ossus. He preached to the Jedi Order's younger, more ambitious members, falsely claiming to have been made a Jedi Master after destroying Freed and Ned, captivating the apprentices with promises of a new Golden Age. Kun lured many of these Jedi to Yavin 4 where, with the help of Sith spirits, he turned them to the dark side. Between these and many other willing converts, he formed an army of Dark Jedi, the Brotherhood of the Sith. This was the first time in galactic history that the Sith rallied an army of fallen Jedi against the Republic, but not the last. In 3996 BBY, with their armies assembled, the Sith went to war against the Republic. This war was less a concerted effort than a series of loosely connected rampages, with the main thrusts simply continuing the Mandalorian Crusades and the Krath Holy Crusade. The Sith and their allies didn't really attempt to capture territory, sticking to their holdings on Yavin, Korriban, the Empress Teta system, Mandalorian space and the Tapani sector. But their fleets, nonetheless, ran roughshod across the entire galaxy, dealing great damage to the Republic and the Jedi Order. One of the earliest of these rampages was the Dark Reaper campaign in which Exar Kun's Sith loyalists unleashed a powerful Sith superweapon, the Dark Reaper, against Republic forces in the Tyon Cluster, devastating Makam Te and Raxus Prime. But Ulik Keldroma was horrified at the weapon's effects, and he secretly leaked information to the Jedi, teaching them how to stop it. The Jedi ultimately destroyed the Dark Reaper in a battle on Thule, but this was only the start of the Great Sith War. At the same time, Krath fleets broke out from the Deep Core and began a campaign of rampages across the Republic. While Mandalore called forth new armies from Mandalore the planet to open new theatres of the Mandalorian Crusades. As his fleets escalated the Krath Holy Crusade, Ulik Keldroma leaked a message to the Republic leading Republic commanders to believe that the Kraths' next major target was Kemplex 9, near Ossus. But as the Republic Navy rallied at Kemplex, Keldroma, Alima Kito, and Mandalore led the vanguard of the Kroth and Mandalorian fleets against their true target, Coruscant itself. With the bulk of the Republic Navy at the other end of the Polemian routes, the Kroth and the Mandalorians had the drop on Coruscant, and their initial attack did massive amounts of damage. Keldroma personally attacked the Republic military's main command center and attempted to force the staff there to order all Republic Navy units to jump to the same coordinates, hoping to have them all jump into each other and thus destroy a good chunk of the Republic fleet. But while Keldroma captured the command center, Alima Kito saw her chance to be rid of the fallen Jedi who had begun to overshadow her among the Krath. She ordered the Krath and Mandalorian forces to retreat, despite the fact that they had the advantage, and they abandoned the assault on Coruscant. In the process, she allowed Ulik to be captured by the Jedi. Even as the Republic emerged victorious on Coruscant, the Krath cut a bloody swath across the known galaxy. Krath fleets travelled down the Polemian Run, winning battles on Chazwa, Tanab, and Geyser, before embarking on a crusade through the heart of galactic civilization. A campaign to cut the slice in half. Krath forces hit Nazri, New Absalon, Randon, Sikapos, Atahox, Nixor, Dalang, Lanik, Bothawi, Mande, Lerator, Ando, Hedessa, Rhodia, cutting all the way from the Polemian to the Corellian run. Meanwhile, the Mandalorian crusaders ravaged Iridonia, Alpharides, Thispias, and Contrum. Together, they threw the entire galaxy into disarray. As the Krath and Mandalorians laid waste to the Republic, the Galactic Senate hoped to boost morale 
by putting Ulik Keldroma on trial. But during the trial, Keldroma was defiant, and the trial was interrupted by a surprise Masasi attack led by Exar Kun and Mandalore. Kun used a Sith spell to freeze the occupants of the Senate Hall, rescued Keldroma, and then gave a speech to the Assembly, using his Sith powers to force the Supreme Chancellor to echo his words. Kun proclaimed that the Sith Empire would rise again, ushering in a new Golden Age, and that the Republic was insignificant in the face of his plans. He then killed the Supreme Chancellor and made to leave, but his exit was blocked by Vodo Siosk Bas, his former Jedi Master. Using his newly crafted double-bladed lightsaber, Kun struck down Siosk Bas and left Coruscant with Mandalore, Ulic, and the Masasi in tow. Kun's speech to the Senate was broadcast across the galaxy, and it served as a signal for the Brotherhood of the Sith. All at once, Kun's followers rose up and attacked their Jedi Masters, murdering many in cold blood. In this brief but devastating Jedi pogrom, Exar Kun's Dark Jedi massacred most of the existing Council and many, many other prominent Masters and Knights. Once Ulic Keldroma was free, he and Exar Kun planned their next big attack, a genuine assault on Kemplex 9. They tasked Alima Kito to lead the offensive, putting her in command of the Corsair, Naga Sadao's old flagship. Under Kito's command, the craft fleet attacked Yablari and Kemplex 9, and then hid out in the nearby Kron Cluster to await the Republic's counterattack. When the Jedi attacked their ships in the cluster, Alima used the ancient weapon aboard the Corsair to rip out the core of one of the Kron Cluster's stars. In the process, however, she destabilized the whole cluster. As Kun and Keldroma had planned, the entire Kron cluster went supernova, killing Alima, her followers, and the Jedi in one great explosion. But the worst was yet to come. Ossus, the home of the Jedi for 20,000 years, was close to the Kron cluster, and the supernova threatened to cleanse its surface of life. With no other option, the Jedi hastily organized a total evacuation of the planet, gathering what artifacts, holocrons, and scrolls they could in the hours they had before the shockwave arrived. During the evacuation, Kun and Keldroma paid Ossus a personal visit, looking to steal what they could from the great library of the Jedi before it was destroyed. Kun and his Masasi took all they could cram in their ship and left, but before Ulik could join the party, he was confronted by his brother Kay. Kay tried to convince Ulik to turn away from the dark side, but Ulik refused, and the Keldroma brothers fought a fierce lightsaber duel. The battle ended when Ulik, enraged at Kay's continued attempts to redeem him, cut down his own brother. Regret consumed him immediately. As Kay died in his arms, Ulik was filled with grief over all he had done. As he knelt over Kay's body, Ulik was found by Nomi Sunrider, who, upon seeing what Ulik had done, used an arcane Jedi technique to sever his connection to the Force. She and the other Jedi fled Ossus soon after, leaving it and millennia of Jedi history to be destroyed by the supernova. But even as Ossus burned, the Republic Navy regrouped and it destroyed what remained of the Krath fleet at Kemplex 9. Republic forces spread out across the known galaxy destroying the marauding Sith fleets one by one. Corellian fleets retook the Tapani sector and crushed the Krath forces at New Kov, Gamor, and Gindin. The Navy's swift fleet advanced through the heart of the slice, destroying the remaining Krath forces in the Battle of Bunta. With Alima Keto dead and Ulik Keldroma captured, the Krath collapsed and the Republic reclaimed the Empress Teta system. The Mandalorians suffered major defeats at Iridonia and Onderon, and in the latter battle, Mandalore the Indomitable was killed, forced down on Duxun and mauled by the jungle beasts. The Jedi, meanwhile, gathered from across the galaxy, rallying to push back their fallen brethren and Exar Kun's Masasi. Ulik Keldroma renounced the Sith and gave the Jedi the location of Kun's stronghold on Yavin 4, and after a decisive victory at Toprawa, 
the Republic's Rim fleet and thousands of Jedi gathered in the skies above the forest moon. There, Exar Kun, defiant and unwilling to accept defeat, gathered the Masasi and performed a great ritual, which he hoped would free his spirit of its mortal confines and allow his power to spread unchecked across the stars. But the Jedi above sensed the evil, and they created a wall of light around Yavin 4, containing the Sith ritual, which instead created a massive firestorm that swept across the entire moon. Every last Masasi was killed, and Kun's body was destroyed. His spirit endured, but it remained trapped in his now abandoned temple. The entirety of the Great Sith War lasted less than a year, but it was insanely devastating. The Jedi lost Ossus, most of their greatest masters, and a great many knights and apprentices. Large swaths of the Republic were left in ruins, and the Republic military practically had to rebuild from the ground up. Additionally, while Kun and Keldroma's reign of terror was short and their Sith coalition was mostly destroyed, they had brought the dark side back to the galaxy, and because of them, the Sith would endure in a new form. The Kroth and Masasi were eliminated and Vajun and Tapani had been cleansed, but remnants of the Sith remained in Dreshde on Korriban, in Kesiak on Thul, and on other Sith worlds. Exar Kun had transformed the Sith from a people to a cause, one that could harness the corrupted remnants of the Republic to fight its wars. Because of Exar Kun, the Sith would endure in the Republic as an internal threat, not an external enemy that could be contained. In just a few short years, they would rise again. Kun's Crusade was just the beginning of the old Sith Wars. Furthermore, the Sith had brought the Mandalorians into conflict with the Republic, and even though Mandalore the Indomitable was dead, a successor quickly laid claim to his helmet on Duxon, Mandalore the Ultimate. This new Mandalore would rally the Mandalorians on that very moon, and just 30 years after the end of the Great Sith War, he led the Mandalorians to war with the Republic once more. At the end of the Great Sith War in 3996 BBY, Exar Kun's Sith Brotherhood was thoroughly dismantled by the Republic and by the Jedi. The Masasi were wiped out and Yavin 4 was scoured. The Krath and the Makrosa Order were purged and their respective territories returned to Republic rule. And the Dark Jedi serving the Sith were almost all slain. The reformed Jedi Council ordered a great hunt against the Tarantatek and other Sith spawn creatures Exar Kun had unleashed. And within a few years, the mission was deemed mostly successful. A few Sith holdouts endured on Korriban and a few other ruined Sith worlds, but for the most part, the Sith were out of the picture, but the Mandalorians weren't. In the Battle of Onderon near the end of the war, the Mandalorian Crusaders, who were allies of the Sith, had been utterly defeated and Mandalore the Indomitable himself had died on Duxon. But a new Mandalore took up his mask and he set about rebuilding the strength of the Mandalorian clans. He called himself Mandalore the Ultimate and he completely reformed Mandalorian society turning the clans from a scattered people of nomadic warriors to a centralized industrial military machine. As the Republic licked its wounds and the Jedi regrouped in their new temple on Coruscant, the Mandalorian Neo-Crusaders began quietly expanding, building their strength for a new crusade. 20 years after the defeat of Exar Kun, the Mandalorians began conquering systems beyond its borders of the Republic, beginning the first stage of the Mandalorian Wars. The Galactic Senate, after much debate, refused to get involved since the Republic was still weak and the Mandalorians avoided attacking Republic member worlds. But this was a mistake. Over the course of the next decade, the Mandalorians conquered a vast chunk of the Outer Rim, giving them the recruits and resources they needed for a more daring offensive. A decade after they began their campaigns in the Outer Rim, the Mandalorians began steadily encroaching on Republic space. In 3964 BBY, they launched an all-out invasion of the Republic and the true war began. For two years, the Neo-Crusaders beat the Republic badly, smashing the Republic Navy in battle after battle and advancing as far as Duro in the Core Worlds. The Republic, desperate, asked the Jedi Order for aid. 
but the council refused. The order was still recuperating from the catastrophic losses it suffered in the war with Exar Kun, and on top of that, many on the council sensed that the Mandalorian Wars weren't what they appeared to be. They felt that some darker force was behind the Mandalorian invasion, and they feared that the brutality of war would draw some of the younger Jedi over to the dark side with potentially disastrous consequences. They wanted time to ascertain the true nature of the threat, but some Jedi refused to wait. Their names were Revan and Malak, and they were two of the Order's most promising Jedi Knights. They believed that the Jedi should join the fight and challenge the Mandalorians head on, and so they ignored the Orders of the Council, gathering a group of like-minded followers and heading off to the front lines. At first, the Jedi Council tried to apprehend these Revanchists, as they were called, but once Revan presented irrefutable proof of the Mandalorian's atrocities at Cathar, the Council reluctantly granted him and his Crusaders sanction. The Supreme Chancellor gave Revan the rank of Supreme Commander and put a third of the entire Republic military under his and Malak's direct command. Many of the Order's strongest Jedi flocked to join them, most notably Mitra Surik, and they were given the rank of general. Revan and his crusaders turned the war around for the Republic, and over the course of two bloody years, they slowly drove the Mandalorians back to the Outer Rim. But the cost was extremely high. Every victory against the Mandalorians came at the cost of thousands of Jedi and Republic soldiers, and the war left countless planets completely devastated. Achieving these victories also came at personal cost to Revan, Malak, and their followers. Revan was a tactical genius, and when he joined the fight, he did so because of his Jedi ideals, because he wanted to protect the innocent. But Revan soon found that not even he could fight a clean war against the Mandalorians, not if he wanted to win. And so Revan and Malak matched the Mandalorians for brutality, becoming increasingly willing to sacrifice entire planets to secure crucial tactical victories. In the Battle of Duxon, Revan ordered tens of thousands to their deaths, many in feints and deliberately high casualty operations in order to capture one of the Mandalorian's most important strongholds. Civilians went from being the reason Revan and Malak had gone to war in the first place to inconveniences that they were willing to sacrifice for victory. These moral shortcuts became easier and easier for the Revanchists as the war went on, and after two years, most of Revan's followers were starting to fall to the dark side, just as the council had feared, as were Revan and Malak themselves. The final blow came in 3960 BBY with the last battle of the Mandalorian Wars. In the Battle of Malachor V, while Revan killed Mandalore the Ultimate, he had his lieutenant, Mitra Surik, use a superweapon called the Mass Shadow Generator to destroy the Mandalorian fleet. In the process, the weapon destroyed a vast portion of the Republic fleet as well as Malachor V itself, compacting thousands of beings into the planet's shattered crust in an instant. This act destroyed the Mandalorians. The survivors issued an unconditional surrender after this atrocity, but it also killed a great many Jedi and Republic officers, almost all of whom, it was later noted, were among the Revanchists who were more critical of Revan's callous tactics. Those in Revan's fleet who survived this battle were more loyal to him than the Jedi or the Republic, exactly as Revan had intended. After the battle was over and the remaining Mandalorians had been disarmed and scattered, Revan gathered his remaining followers and headed into unknown space, claiming to be hunting down Mandalorian remnants. Even as the Republic celebrated them as the saviors of the galaxy, they vanished and no one knew where they had gone. Then, a few hours later, they returned as conquerors. Before the battle, Revan had found something on Malachor V, the Treus Academy, an ancient Sith fortress. There, he encountered teachings of the Sith, which he introduced to Malak. By that point, both men were in the grip of the dark side, Malak more so than Revan, and they were starting to embrace it. They disseminated the Sith teachings through the ranks of their followers, and even as they won the Mandalorian Wars for the Republic, they began to prepare for a new war, one in which they would be the aggressors. For it was at Malachor V, from the dying words of Mandalore the Ultimate, that they learned even darker secrets than the teachings of the Sith, whispers of another threat waiting beyond the Outer Rim, 
and this led Revan to believe that the Republic needed to be transformed into something stronger. Heeding Mandalore's last words, Revan and Malak traveled alone into the unknown regions, and for a time, not even their followers knew where they had gone. When they returned, they began to work on a plan to conquer the Republic and establish a new Sith Empire. The first stage of this plan involved a bit of archaeology work. During the Mandalorian Wars, Revan and Malak had discovered something interesting near the Jedi Enclave on Dantooine, ancient ruins containing a star map. A droid in the ruins, tens of thousands of years old, told them that the site was built as a monument to the Star Forge, the greatest achievement of the ancient Infinite Empire. Revan and Malak knew of no such civilization, but on Malakor V, they learned more. The Infinite Empire, as we discussed in our first episode, was a dark side civilization controlled by the Rakata that had ruled the galaxy in the years before the Republic. The Republic had deliberately purged the Rakata from history long ago. The Sith, whose pure blood predecessors developed their identity in an ancient war with the Infinite Empire, had not. Revan and Malak learned that the Star Forge was a massive force-attuned space station in the Rakata's home system a powerful tool of the dark side that used stellar matter and the force to create infinite fleets of warships and battle droids. Revan and Malak saw it as their ticket for crushing the Republic, but the star map on Dantooine was damaged and incomplete, so they were forced to travel all over the galaxy looking for others, hoping that multiple would give them enough data to triangulate the Star Forge's location. From Malakor, Revan, Malak, and Revan's newly built assassin droid, HK-47, traveled to Korriban, where they allied with the Sith remnants and found the star map hidden in the tomb of Naga Sadal. They found others in the shadowlands of Kashyyyk, the Rakat Rift on Manan, and in an ancient temple deep in the deserts of Tatooine. Eventually, they were able to triangulate the location of Rakata Prime, and they led their fleet of followers to the Starforge. Revan and Malak claimed the station as their own, and from the command deck of the Starforge, they at last proclaimed themselves the new Dark Lords of the Sith. They became Darth Revan and Darth Malak, the rulers of a new Sith Empire. Their followers, who had by this point become corrupted by the teachings from Malakor, embraced the change, and with the power of the Starforge, these new Sith began to amass a massive war fleet. In 3959 BBY, the new Dark Lords revealed themselves to the galaxy and declared war on the Republic. For months after the Battle of Malakor V, everyone believed that Revan and Malak were dead. They and their followers had disappeared into unknown space and no one had heard from them since. Then, in 3959 BBY, they returned at the head of an invasion fleet appearing above the Foros shipyards and opening fire on Republic forces without warning. At Foros, Darth Revan and Darth Malak proclaimed to the galaxy that they were the Dark Lords of a new Sith Empire, and they urged the people of the galaxy to join them. In the Battle of Foros, these new Sith captured a vast portion of the Republic Navy, stealing hundreds of ships from Drydock before retreating back to Sith space. They used these captured ships to bolster their original fleet, and the one they were building with the Star Forge, and they sent it out to conquer the Republic. In a matter of weeks, the Sith spread out from their holdings on Korriban and in the Unknown Regions, crushing Republic forces at Roach, Xilla, Alantine 6, and Yagdul. Revan and his followers urged their former comrades in the Republic and Jedi Order to join them and help them build their new empire, and many did. This was because Revan's Sith were different from the Orders that had come before. The ancient Sith had been entirely alien to the Republic, an existential threat from wild space. Exarch Kun's Sith had mostly been a mix of Jedi and Republic traitors, but they went to great lengths to distance themselves from their former comrades and make clear they were something new. But Revan and Malak were heroes of the Republic. Their Sith were entirely homegrown. Their empire was just a corrupt remnant of the Republic. They were familiar in a way that the Sith hadn't been before, and they came at a time when people were losing faith in the Republic and the Jedi. Many in the Republic and the Jedi Order found it easy to make the same choice Revan's original followers had made, to put their loyalty to the heroes of the Mandalorian Wars 
above their loyalty to crumbling, failed institutions. Many Jedi sided with Revan instead of the Council, and many in the Republic military switched sides, including some of the Navy's top officers such as General Derrid, Mon Halan, and most significantly, Admiral Karath. And as the leaders of the Republic military jumped ship, vast numbers of their subordinates followed suit, trading in their black and orange Republic jumpsuits for sleek chrome Sith trooper armor. As Revan conquered vast swaths of the Republic, he kept a lot of local government structures intact, grafting old systems into a loose military hierarchy instead of attempting to redo everything from the ground up. Sith governors, many of them Dark Jedi, were usually installed on conquered planets with garrisons of Sith troopers. They acted as overseers for the existing government, ensuring that the Sith always got their way. Nonetheless, on many worlds, very little actually changed under the Sith Empire, apart from a greater push toward militarization, reinforcing the impression many had that the Sith weren't really much different from the Republic. The bulk of the Sith Empire itself was a massive military machine composed of armies of Sith troopers and war droids, squadrons of Rakatan designed Sith fighters, and vast fleets of Interdictor class cruisers and Centurion class battle cruisers. Revan's Sith Order, which consisted of legions of Dark Jedi, Sith assassins, and a selection of Sith apprentices, acolytes, and lords, operated alongside the ordinary military forces. Both were under the overall command of Darth Revan and Darth Malak. The official capital of the Sith Empire was Korriban, where Revan founded a Sith Academy in the Valley of the Dark Lords. But in practice, the government of the Empire was highly mobile. The Sith Empire, despite controlling vast swathes of territory, effectively operated as a stateless force, a massive independent fleet run by a small clique of officers and Sith Lords who were always on the move. As we've described, the non-force sensitive elements of the Sith Empire strongly resembled the Republic, but the ordinary followers of Revan and Malak were rapidly corrupted by Sith teachings that spread through the ranks. The heroes of the Mandalorian Wars transformed into monsters, with formerly principled men like Saul Karath carrying out terrible atrocities in Revan's name, such as the bombing of Telos IV in which Admiral Karath and Darth Malak cleansed an entire planet of life. For two years, the Sith had a decisive advantage, and there was seemingly little the Republic could do to stop them. The Sith conquered dozens of sectors in the Core Worlds, along the Inner Rimmer trade route, and along the Inner Corellian Run, seizing major shipbuilding worlds of Fondor, Rendili, Corellia, and Duro. But it was in the Rim that Revan's most devastating victories were won, between 3959 and 3957 BBY, the Sith pushed from Korriban all the way to the expansion region, conquering the Tyon Cluster and much of the Mid Rim. By the second year of the war, the Sith controlled a full third of the known galaxy. The Republic was completely outmatched, not only by the Sith's infinite fleet, but by the tactical genius of Darth Revan. Revan systematically dismantled the Republic's defenses with surgical precision, and though few noticed at the time, he was very delicate in doing so. Revan went to great lengths to keep infrastructure and military production facilities intact, as despite the potential of the Star Forge, Revan preferred to use it as little as possible, instead shifting increasingly more of Sith military production onto captured facilities, wary of the station's corrupting influence. Revan would have succeeded easily were it not for Bastila Shen. Bastila was one of the Jedi Order's best and brightest, a young Jedi gifted in the art of battle meditation. Her gift allowed her to turn the tide of entire battles, and she helped the Republic win enough victories to hold together during the height of Revan's onslaught. In 3957 BBY, she dealt the Sith an even greater blow. She lured Revan and Malak into battle against a small Republic fleet, and then led a small team of Jedi Knights in boarding Revan's flagship, aiming to capture the Dark Lord. They cornered Revan on his flagship bridge, but even as they confronted him, another of the Sith vessels opened fire on Revan's own ship. For years, by this point, Darth Malak had been waiting for his chance. He'd wanted to take the title of Dark Lord from Revan since the beginning, and he disagreed with how his master was running the war. 
and 3958 BBY, he had even challenged Revan in a lightsaber duel, only for the Dark Lord to beat him and slice off his jaw as punishment. But when Revan was cornered by the Jedi, Malak saw another opportunity, a chance to kill all of his enemies in one fell swoop. He ordered his ship to fire on Revan's bridge, hoping to kill both Revan and Bastila. Revan was badly wounded by the attack, and he would have died had Bastila not pulled his body from the wreckage, used the force to keep him alive, and brought him back to the Jedi Council. The Council had originally hoped that Revan's defeat would cause the Sith Empire to collapse or falter, but they were mistaken. No sooner had the galaxy learned of Darth Revan's apparent death than Darth Malak claimed the title of Dark Lord and picked up where his master had left off, resuming the war with the Republic. With the Republic on the verge of collapse, the Jedi Council decided on a desperate last gambit. They healed Revan's broken body and used the force to wipe his mind, implanting him with a new personality, one loyal to the Republic. They created a false identity for him as a Republic soldier under Bastila's command, hoping that, over the course of working with Bastila, enough of his memories would resurface that he could lead the Republic to the Star Forge. Meanwhile, Darth Malak settled into place as the new Dark Lord of the Sith, naming Darth Bandon his new apprentice. Under Malak, the tactics of the Sith became far less subtle. Gone were the complex plans of Revan, and gone was his desire to preserve infrastructure and production facilities. Malak's attacks were overwhelming and incredibly destructive, and he came to rely on the Star Forge to a greater extent than Revan ever had. Also, unlike Revan, Malak made it his main priority to hunt down Bastila, who remained a thorn in his side. In 3956 BBY, he cornered her ship, the Endar Spire, above Taurus, where he unknowingly began the final chapter of the Jedi Civil War. Malak won the battle above Taurus, forcing Bastila, Revan, and Republic war hero Karthanasi to seek shelter on the planet's surface. There, they worked together to escape the forces of the Sith, and during their time together, Revan's memories finally began to resurface. Malak destroyed the surface of Tyrus in a bid to kill Bastila, but she and her allies managed to escape to Dantooine, where Revan had a vision of he and Malak discovering the first star map all those years ago. The Jedi Council chose to retrain Revan as a Jedi, and then sent him, Bastila, and their allies to find the star maps, hoping to locate the Star Forge and stop the Sith once and for all. Like Revan and Malak had years before, Revan and Bastila used the incomplete Dantooine star map to locate others on Tatooine, Kashyyyk, and Manan. On the latter world, the Jedi killed Darth Bandon, but they were captured by Admiral Karath's flagship, the Leviathan, as they attempted to flee the system. Karthanasi killed Admiral Karath as he and the others attempted to escape the Leviathan, but he, Bastila, and Revan were confronted by Malak himself before they could get away. Malak revealed Revan's true identity and captured Bastila, who he tortured into falling to the dark side and becoming his new apprentice. Around the same time, Malak's fleet attacked Dantooine, destroying the Jedi Enclave there and crippling the Jedi Order. Despite the knowledge of who he used to be, Revan remained committed to the path of the light. He found one final star map on Korriban and then led the Republic fleet to Rakata Prime to destroy the Star Forge. At the same time, the Sith were also gathering in the Rakata system. With Bastila as his new apprentice, Malak believed himself invincible and he was gathering a vast fleet for a final offensive against the Core Worlds. A huge portion of the Sith Armada, as well as Admiral Varko and most of the Sith's top officers and Dark Jedi, had all gathered at the Star Forge. After a confrontation with Bastila on Rakata Prime, Revan and the others joined Admiral Dodonar and the Republic Navy in the assault on the Star Forge. They boarded the Star Forge and fought their way to Bastila, who fought Revan one on one. Revan eventually managed to convince Bastila, with whom he developed a romantic relationship over the course of their mission, to abandon the Sith and use her battle meditation to aid the Republic. As Revan went off alone to confront Malak, Bastila helped the Republic fleet shatter the Sith defensive line and close in on the Star Forge itself. In a final duel, the redeemed Revan killed Darth Malak, 
and then he and his allies fled the Starforge before the Republic destroyed its orbital stabilizers, causing it to fall into the sun. Just like that, Revan, Bastila, and the Republic broke the back of the Sith Empire. Malak and all of the Sith leaders were killed in the Battle of Rakata Prime, as was the vanguard of the Sith Armada. The Republic's resounding victory won them the entire war, as the now leaderless Sith Empire tore itself apart in its own brief but destructive civil war. In a single day, the Sith went from the verge of victory to a resounding defeat. But the story of Revan's Sith doesn't end with the Jedi Civil War. The remnants of the Sith escaped to the Outer Rim, and from the shattered battlefields of the Mandalorian Wars, they now led a new war against the Jedi. In the last episode, we discussed the unique structure of Revan's empire, that of a strictly hierarchical military alliance over which the Sith had complete control. Under Revan and Malak, this structure allowed the Sith to conquer a third of the Republic, but after the Battle of Rakata Prime, the whole system collapsed. At Rakata Prime, the Sith not only lost the Starforge, but also Darth Malak, all of the highest ranking Sith apprentices and Darth Jedi, Admiral Varko and the leading commanders of the Sith Armada, and a huge portion of the Sith fleet. The entire senior leadership of the Sith Empire was wiped out. In the wake of this catastrophic defeat, the Sith did what they did best. They destroyed each other. The Sith Empire plunged into a civil war of its own, fracturing under the leadership of warlords and would-be dark lords of the Sith. Over the course of just a year, the Sith Empire disintegrated and the Republic rapidly reclaimed nearly all of its lost territory. By 3955 BBY, a year after the Battle of Rakata Prime, the Republic military had pushed all the way into the heart of Sith space, planning to lay siege to Korriban and snuff out what remained of the Sith. But they found the planet lifeless. The city of Dreshde had been abandoned, and the Sith Academy was in ruins. From the Sith corpses that littered the planet, the Republic determined that the Sith had wiped themselves out, though they found evidence that at least one Sith Lord had escaped Korriban and fled deep into the Outer Rim. The Sith Empire, the Republic arrogantly concluded, had ceased to exist. But the Republic's troubles weren't over yet. It barely survived the Jedi Civil War, as had the Jedi Order itself, and it struggled to rebuild. The redeemed Revan, who could have helped give the Republic a hero to rally around, disappeared, heading into the unknown regions in search of a terrible threat that he had begun to remember. And though the Sith Empire had indeed been destroyed, the Sith themselves had not. After the fall of Korriban, they had fled to the most remote reaches of Sith space, and the strongest among them gathered on a lonely world far from the Republic's reach. They came to Malachor V, the last battlefield of the Mandalorian Wars, where their order took a new form. At the end of the Mandalorian Wars, Malachor V was destroyed by the Mass Shadow Generator, a Republic superweapon meant to annihilate the Mandalorian fleet. The mass death caused by the weapon was so great that it created a wound in the Force centered on Malachor V, a wound that was made worse by the Treyas Academy, an abandoned stronghold of the ancient Sith that lay at the heart of the planet. During the Jedi Civil War, the Sith had used Malachor V as a secret stronghold, sending captured Jedi there to be broken. When Korriban fell, it was there that the Sith regrouped. At Malachor V, the Sith came under the rule of the three greatest Sith Lords to emerge from the ashes of Revan's Empire, Darth Sion, Darth Nihilus, and Darth Treya. Sion was the self-proclaimed Lord of Pain, a Sith Marauder who was able to survive any wound through the use of the Dark Side. His body was covered in innumerable scars, and his bones had been shattered thousands of times. But he quite literally held himself together through the Force, drawing on his constant pain to survive. Sion was a committed Jedi Hunter, the leader of a sect of assassins looking to wipe out the Jedi. Darth Nihilus, the Lord of Hunger, was a walking wound in the Force, an extension of Malachor that had been created when the planet died. He was a black hole in the Force, more of an entity than a living being, and he consumed all life around him, killing with his mere presence. 
He was motivated by constant hunger for the Force, and he was capable of consuming entire planets at a time. Nihilus was the master of a fleet of wrecked ships that he tore from the gravity well at Malachor V, crewed by half-living Sith troopers that became mere extensions of his will. But in the Sith Triumvirate that formed in the Treyas Academy, both Sion and Nihilus were junior partners, the apprentices of Darth Treya, the Lord of Betrayal. Once, she'd been a Jedi Master, and long ago, she had trained Revan himself in the ways of the Force. She'd been exiled by the Jedi and become enthralled by the teachings of the Sith in the Treyas Academy, of which she became the Master. She trained Sion and Nihilus to have greater control over their abilities, and together with them, she oversaw the next stage of the old Sith Wars, the Dark Wars. Trey believed that Revan's Sith Empire had the wrong priority. The Republic, she claimed, was insignificant. To her and the other surviving Sith Lords, the only thing that mattered was destroying the Jedi. It was all that had ever truly mattered, they believed, for if the Jedi were destroyed, then the Sith would be forever victorious no matter if the galaxy was ruled by a republic or an empire. Thus, the Sith Triumvirate abandoned the strategy of direct war against the Republic, instead choosing to wage a series of shadow wars to weaken it and destroy the Jedi. As part of this campaign, Nihilus and Sion carried out the first Jedi Purge, seeking to wipe out the Sith's greatest enemies once and for all. After the end of the Jedi Civil War, there were barely a hundred Jedi left in the galaxy, their numbers devastated by defections to the Sith and Revan's assassins. But the Triumvirate began quietly whittling away at even that hundred. Sion and his assassins hunted down and slew dozens of Jedi, and wherever groups of Jedi gathered, Darth Nihilus came for them, sensing their presence through the Force and feeding on them and the planets where they gathered. In 3952 BBY, more remained of the Jedi Order gathered on the planet Qatar to try and determine what was attacking them only for them to draw out Nihilus. He consumed Qatar, killing the Jedi and all other life on the planet. The Jedi Order ceased to exist. Those few that remained went into exile, unwilling to endanger others with their presence. With the Jedi destroyed, however, the Sith Triumvirate splintered. Nihilus and Sion allied against Treya, cutting her off from the Force and exiling her, each proclaiming themselves the new Dark Lord of the Sith. They then went their separate ways, dividing the Sith remnants between them as they hunted down the last of the Jedi. As Nihilus and Sion sought to win their war with the Jedi, Darth Treya, taking up the name Kreia, sought out Mitra Surik, a Jedi exile who had lost her connection to the Force in the Battle of Malachor V. Kreia's fall had led her to become disillusioned with the Sith as well as the Jedi. Indeed, she had begun to hate the Force itself. In Surik, Kreia saw someone who was strong enough to live without the Force, and she hoped to get the Exile to agree with her newfound views. But Kreia wasn't the only one looking for the Exile. Sion and Nihilus believed her to be the last Jedi, and they sought to kill her and finish off the Jedi once and for all. Sion chased Kreia and the Exile to Paragus too. They managed to escape his grasp and flee the system. As Sion tried to stop them from escaping Paragus, he ignited the system's volatile asteroid belt, destroying the entire planet in an enormous chain reaction. This endangered the Telos Restoration Project, which was vital to the Republic's continued existence. Telos, which had been destroyed by the Sith during the Jedi Civil War, was a test to see if destroyed worlds could be terraformed back to life, and the future of the Republic depended on the success of its restoration project. Unfortunately, Telos was entirely dependent on Paragian fuel, and after the destruction of Paragus, the future of the project was uncertain. To make matters worse, Nihilus's faction of the Sith had allied with General Vaklu of Onderon, a power-hungry man who wanted to overthrow his cousin, Queen Talia of Aziz, and secede from the Republic. Knowing that the secession of Onderon would both severely weaken the Republic and make it an easy target for his hunger, Nihilus secretly backed Vaklu's secession efforts. He sent troops under a team of Sith Masters to the Tomb of Freedom Nad on Duxon, where they carried out an arcane ritual that allowed the Sith to take control of the beasts of Onderon. When Vaklu made his move and civil war erupted on Aziz, the Sith led these beasts into battle alongside Vaklu's troops. Queen Talia didn't stand a chance, 
and if Onderon fell, neither did the Republic. However, the Sith's attempts to destabilize the Republic were ultimately thwarted by Mitra Surik. After escaping Praga, she set out to find the surviving Jedi Masters and convince them to unite against the Sith, gathering allies and stopping Sith plots along the way. Darth Nihilus sent his apprentice, Visas Ma, to assassinate the Exile, but Visas ended up switching sides and joining the Exile instead. Surik found solutions to many of Telos' problems and intervened in the Onderon Civil War, bringing about the defeat of General Vaklu and Nihilus' troops. She also confronted Darth Sion on Korriban, though their battle proved inconclusive. Unbeknownst to Surik, however, she was playing into Kraya's hands the whole time. When she gathered the surviving Jedi Masters on Dantooine, Kraya revealed her identity as Darth Treya and killed them all. She convinced the sole surviving Jedi Master, Atris, to embrace the dark side and then gave Nihilus a false tip about a Jedi Academy on Telos. The Exile and her allies raced to Telos just as Nihilus' fleet began an attack on the planet. Telos seemed doomed, but beyond all hope, Mitra Surik managed to save the day once more. She defeated and apprehended Atris, led the allies she had gathered along the way in a desperate defense of Telos, and then she and Visas boarded Nihilus' flagship, the Ravager. There, Nihilus tried to consume Surik, but he found himself unable to touch her due to her severance from the Force. With Visas' help, Surik then attacked and destroyed the Lord of Hunger. With Telos safe and the Republic's future secure, Surik and her allies traveled to Malachor V to stop Kraya who sought to amplify the wound in the Force there to cut off the galaxy from the Force. Surik single-handedly fought her way through the Treyas Academy, which Kraya had usurped control of. She convinced Darth Sion to end his cycle of pain and embrace death, and then confronted and defeated Kraya. Surik then ordered the reactivation of the mass shadow generator, which destroyed Malachor V for good and cleansed the wound in the Force there. Between the Battle of Telos and the destruction of Malachor V, the last remnants of Revan's Sith Empire were destroyed, and by 3950 BBY, the Dark Wars were over. Yet again, the Republic and the Jedi had won against all odds, but Surik's journey and the fight against the Sith didn't end at Malachor. As Malachor broke apart, Mitra Surik traveled into the unknown regions in search of Revan himself. There, she discovered that Though Malachor V was no more and the Sith Empire had ceased to exist, the threat of the Dark Side still remained. Because the Masters of the Jedi Council had been right all those years ago, there had been something darker behind the Mandalorian Wars, an evil force waiting for the Jedi to come and find it. Before they began their own crusade against the Republic, Revan and Malak had discovered it, and all Revan had done had been in preparation for it. His campaign was just a foretaste of the real war. A war of belief that had been going on for thousands of years, and he had fought to harden the galaxy against an evil beyond comprehension. Because the Sith, the true Sith, were waiting in the dark. They had been biding their time for over a thousand years. But as Malachor V broke apart, their return was near at hand. Revan had left to fight them, and the Exile went to join him but not even they could prevent the war that was to come. When we last saw Revan, he had vanished, traveling into unknown space in pursuit of a shadowy threat he had begun remembering. The danger, it turns out, was the true Sith. Let's go back a few thousand years to the end of the Great Hyperspace War in 5000 BBY. The Sith Empire, led by Naga Sadao, lost that war. In its aftermath, the original Sith Empire fell apart and Naga Sadao self-exiled on Yavin 4. But that wasn't the end of the Sith. One group of Sith, led by Darth Vishyat, held together and retreated to the unknown regions where they wandered in search of a new homeworld. 20 years after the end of the war, they stumbled across the forgotten world of Drummond Kaas, which they settled and began the long process of rebuilding their empire. These were the true Sith, direct successors of the original Sith Empire the Dark Jedi had established on Korriban so many millennia ago, and for a time, they lay low. Darth Vishit, who had led the Sith to their new homeworld, proclaimed himself the new Dark Lord of the Sith and the Emperor of his budding Sith Empire. With the support of the Dark Council, 
a council of Sith Lords he founded to serve as the Empire's administrative body, Vishit began the slow process of rebuilding the Empire's military. For over a thousand years, they slowly grew their forces, expanding to other worlds in the system and gathering strength. And that's when Revan came across them, the first time. You see, Revan and Malak may have been falling to the dark side during the Mandalorian Wars, but the final push came from outside. They had once encountered the true Sith. Vishit tortured them himself until they both fell to the dark side, at which point they were sent back to the Republic as the precursors to the Sith Empire's return. The new Darths, however, managed to break free of his conditioning and sought to make their own Sith Empire. After the Battle of Malachor V, a redeemed Revan began remembering the Sith he had encountered in the Unknown Regions and set out to investigate the lingering memory. At which point, he was captured once more. For three years, Revan was imprisoned on Dramund Kars. His stint in prison was cut short, however, by an unlikely pair of allies, his former lieutenant and exile Mitra Surik and Lord Scourge, a Sith pureblood that had served Vishit for years. Scourge had had a vision of a person who would stand up to Vishit and put a stop to his evil plans for the galaxy, which we'll get to later. Sith or no, Scourge didn't want his emperor to succeed. Believing Revan to be the one who would take down the emperor, he allied with Surik and freed him. Together, the three began plotting their assault on Vishit in a cave on Dramund Kars. Before they could put their plan in action, however, Scourge realized that Revan wasn't really the Chosen One he'd seen in his vision. In order to ensure he would still be around to help the Chosen One when the time came, he betrayed Revan and Surik. The Sith captured them once more, and that was the last of Revan anyone saw for a very long time. For 300 years, the Sith Empire continued to operate in the shadows, gathering its strength. But then, in a flash of strength the galaxy hadn't seen in millennia, the Sith re-emerged and took their war to the Republic. Unlike the Sith who had come before him, Vishit didn't plan on charging in, guns a-blazing. One of the benefits of immortality was patience, and Vishit knew that if he wanted to win the war he planned on waging, he had to be smarter about it than his predecessors had been. So, for a thousand years, he concentrated solely on building his forces. In that time, the Sith fleet grew to enormous numbers and his military expanded significantly. As early as 4000 BBY, Vishit was already preparing the way for his eventual invasion. In 3954 BBY, he sent Darth Revan and Darth Malak as vanguards for his return. When that plan failed, instead of rushing in on the tail end of the Jedi Civil War when the Republic was vulnerable, he bided his time. Over the next 300 years, Imperial citizens began infiltrating the Republic. Vishit secretly installed puppet governments in the Outer Rim and brokered covert agreements with other Republic agents. By the time he was ready to strike, the Belkaden, Rula, and Cernpedal systems of the Dalenblant sector were under his payroll. He made sure that he had moles within the Republic power structure that, once war broke out, would ally with his Sith Empire and fracture the Republic from within. Among those allies were the Chiss Ascendancy, which provided the Empire with crucial intelligence. Meanwhile, the Imperial Navy was feverishly preparing for the oncoming invasion. Drills were carried out daily and soldiers were conscripted and trained specifically for the war. Those three centuries weren't easy on the Republic either. The Mandalorian Wars and the Jedi Civil War had weakened the Republic significantly. After the exile defeated the Sith Triumvirate on Malachor V, the Republic only got a moment's respite before the Kanz Disorders. That was a 300-year war that took place in the Kanz Sector between 3970 and 3670 BBY that certainly put a strain on an already exhausted Republic. So, when the Sith Empire finally made their move, they positioned their fleets in key locations just outside Republic space. And then, they attacked. In 3681 BBY, the reconstituted Sith Empire, as it came to be known, emerged from the unknown regions and waged war. The conflict that broke out would last for almost 30 years until 3653 BBY, 
and was known as the Great Galactic War. Out of seemingly nowhere, a massive Sith fleet tore into the Outer Rim territories and began taking world after world. One of the first worlds the Sith targeted was their ancestral home of Korriban, which the Jedi had guarded for centuries. Jedi Master Kao Sandarach and his Padawan Satil Shen had been stationed on the world with a small garrison of Republic troopers when Sith Lord Vindican and his apprentice Malgus attacked. The 30 Imperial warships they brought with them rapidly overwhelmed the defenders. And just like that, the Sith had their holy world back. At the same time, Imperial warships appeared in Tingle and Aparo sectors. Vindican waited for the light diplomatic vessels the Republic sent out to resolve the conflict to arrive. He wanted them to send back intel on the size of his fleet before he destroyed them, thus beginning a psychological war on the people of the Republic. When the Republic sent a sizable military fleet to respond to the attack, Vitiates and the systems he had bought snared them in a trap and destroyed them utterly. After their victory, the Sith lost no time in destroying the starship manufacturing facilities in the Sluis sector, where many Republic starfighters were built, then took Sluis itself. Any civilians or governments that refused to swear fealty to the Emperor were executed, spreading fear. The Galactic Senate, meanwhile, was too busy arguing about the nature of the threat to take real action. The Jedi, however, were quicker to recognize the threat of the Sith, for once, and took the lead in the war against the Sith invaders. Their heroic deeds inspired the Republic to stand with them, launching counterattacks in the Minos Cluster and the Seswena Sector. Over the coming years, the Republic would lose the Battle of Korriban and the Battle of Balmora. The Empire took Ilum, Dathomir and Manan, the loss of which was a devastating blow to any war effort. By the time the Sith took Agamar and Utapau, they controlled almost half of the Outer Rim. At this point, we're 10 years into this war, and the Sith have been continuously expanding. Once they were done in the Outer Rim, the Sith drove inwards, hoping to take both away in the Mid Rim. The Republic, however, had managed to pull itself together enough to force a stalemate of sorts. On Bothaway, the Republic took the initial victory. Unwilling to let it go, the Imperials sent a vast force fighting viciously. Their huge losses, 10 Imperials dead for every one Republic trooper, didn't discourage them. Although the Sith did eventually win, it was at a huge cost. Another force that was decimating Republic fleets were the Dreadmasters, six Sith united by a force bond that used their battle meditation and powers of fear to psychologically cripple entire fleets. Thanks to a strike team led by a Jedi Knight, the Republic was able to capture the Dreadmasters and seal them away in the prison worlds of Belsavis, where they were imprisoned for the next few decades. Their loss was a huge blow to the Sith Empire, but it didn't turn the tide fully in the favor of the Republic. So far, the war, albeit bloody, had been confined to the outer and mid rim. That soon changed when Malgus, now a new Darth, attacked Alderaan in the core. Malgus lured the Republic fleet protecting Alderaan away before striking. The invasion was brutal, but it was met with a local force of troopers and Jedi would happen to make a stop on the planet. This small force took Malgus's army on, fighting mainly in the mountainous and forest regions to impede the Imperial advance. Shan and Havok squad fought Malgus and his forces head on, with Shan managing to seriously injure the Sith. The Battle of Alderaan ended in a Republic victory, which provided its citizens with some much needed morale. Spurred on from their successful defense of the core, the Republic retook some worlds in the mid rim and even reclaimed some territory in the Minos Cluster. Recognizing the need for a new ally, the Sith Empire meddled in the Mandalorian's affairs and installed a puppet Mandalore. The United Mandalorian clans allied with the Empire and, at their behest, blockaded the Hidian Way, which was the Republic's most critical trade route. It lasted long enough that riots broke out on Coruscant and Republic forces stationed farther out were forced to retreat. Eventually, the blockade was broken but it undeniably damaged both Republic morale and their war effort. When the Republic managed to both break the Mandalorian blockade and defeat the Sith at Order Adama, they managed to recover enough to press into Imperial-occupied space. Republic forces attacked Korriban 
then laid siege to Ziost, close to the heart of the empire. In the end, however, the Sith navy overwhelmed them and pushed forwards. They took Sereno and Ordradama in a new offensive, then tried to take Renva. The Republic managed to defend that final world, but it was perhaps the last victory they saw in the war. Almost 30 years into the war, the Imperials were breathing down the Corps' neck, butchering and executing any opposition in their way. They seemed to have the upper hand, which is why the galaxy was shocked when they offered the Republic a chance to negotiate for peace. Understandably suspicious, the Jedi recommended the Senate ignore the offer. Both they and the Senate recognized, however, they couldn't win this war. At the very least, negotiations might buy them some time to rest. Thus, Grandmaster Zim was delegated to lead a contingent of Jedi and Senators to the negotiations on Alderaan, where they would discuss the terms of the peace treaty. It turns out, they were right to be cautious. While the diplomats politicked on Alderaan, a massive Sith fleet appeared in the sky above Coruscant itself and bombarded it mercilessly. In the sacking of Coruscant, as it came to be known, the planet was invaded, occupied, and broken. The Jedi Temple was bombed, and Sith stormed the ruins to slaughter the Jedi within. When the temple was completely destroyed, and the planetary defenses disarmed, the Sith took the entire planet hostage. The Sith even slew the Supreme Chancellor and took his office as their command center. With their capital world under Sith control, the peace delegation on Alderaan had no choice but to accept the Empire's terms. The Treaty of Coruscant, as it came to be known, was essentially a Republic defeat. The Republic and Jedi had to stand down and withdraw into Republic space. The Sith Empire was recognized as the legitimate ruler of half the galaxy, and the Republic ceded even more worlds to the Sith. The Republic had lost. Although the Treaty of Coruscant ended the 30-year Great Galactic War, the ensuing peace was only on paper. In the aftermath, the Republic turned on the Jedi Order, blaming them for their defeat in the war, even though the Jedi had thrown themselves into the fray to bide the Republic time to gather its bearings and respond to sudden incursions. Faced with the Republic's criticism and the destruction of their temple on Coruscant, the Jedi Order gathered what numbers they had left and returned to the tranquil world of Tython, their ancestral homeworld. There, they rebuilt. Although they were still committed to protecting the Republic, the Order took a step back for some time. After winning the war, the Sith Empire was at its peak, with almost half the galaxy under its control, a newly reopened Sith Academy on Korriban, and many booming industries. However, the Sith Emperor didn't seem to be interested in his empire any longer and left to pursue his own goals. He was still the head of the Empire, but the Dark Council he had founded ruled in his name, handling the daily concerns of the Empire on every front, from agriculture to warfare. The two galactic powers had found a restless balance for the time being, but neither was willing to stay dormant. Over the next decade, open war gave way to a cold war between the Republic and the Sith Empire. During the Cold War, both sides schemed to undermine the other. Conflicts spread out across the galaxy, but neither side openly acknowledged it. Thus, they fought over worlds like Balmora, Tyrus, Alderaan, and resources such as the Poison Mines on Quesh. But instead of openly going at each other, they relied on covert ops teams to jeopardize the other's plans and sway the local populace toward their goals. Thus, the Cold War saw the Republic managing to reclaim control over Balmora and the Empire prevailing on Tyrus. Alderaan was a tricky matter, and the victor really depends on who you ask. But with each passing year, tensions grew higher and higher. The Cold War couldn't last forever. In 3643 BBY, just 10 years after the end of the Great Galactic War, the Republic and Sith Empire were at war once more. The Galactic War was upon the galaxy. In the early stages of the Galactic War, which was in essence a continuation of the Great Galactic War, the Republic and Sith Empire started by reigniting disputes that had gone unresolved during the previous war. 
One surprising turn of event during the war was the recovery of a long lost Republic hero. The Republic, guided by a pure but unfamiliar spirit, was led to the Imperial Fortress world of Tarrell V. There, a Republic strike force gathered key intelligence about a Sith prison known as the Foundry. Another strike team, supported by Fleet Admiral and Jedi Master Oteg, travelled into the Maelstrom to storm the prison, where they were stunned to find none other than Revan himself, imprisoned in stasis for 300 years. Mitra Surik, as it turned out, had guided them to him, wishing to see her old friend finally free. The Republic strike team freed him, but Revan soon vanished once more and didn't involve himself in the ongoing war. Meanwhile, other Republic and Jedi forces also sought to take out the Sith Emperor. One attempt in particular banked on the hero of Tython, a young Jedi. This, Lord Scourge had realized, was the real person he had seen in his vision all those centuries ago. With Scourge's help, the hero of Tython managed to finally kill Vitiate. It turned out that Vitiate's long-term plan, the plan that Scourge had been so hell-bent on subverting, was to increase his own power by devouring all life in the galaxy. That was how Vitiate had survived this long to begin with. He fed off planets by sucking them dry of the force and using the energy to prolong his life. With the fake Nihilus slain, however, the Republic could finally breathe a sigh of relief. In other parts of the galaxy, the two factions continued to clash. On Velsavis, Imperial strike teams managed to liberate the Dreadmasters who had been thought dead during the last war. Republic and Sith forces fought in the black hole on Corellia in Sector 10 and other planets, but it was Corellia that was the epicenter of the war. The Battle of Corellia, as it was later known as, was a huge offensive launched by both factions. The Sith laid claim to the core world first, and with three members of the Dark Council planet side coordinating the ground assault, they seemed to overrun the planet's defenses. However, the Green Jedi Enclave of Corellia held them off long enough to buy the Republic and Jedi enough time to swoop in and repel the invading forces. Despite the immeasurable damage caused to the planet, the Republic were victorious. The loss of the Sith Emperor had boosted Republic morale, but it had an odd effect on the Sith. Namely, with the Emperor gone, many opposing factions in the Dark Council and the Empire began to infight. The Sith had always been their own worst enemies, and with the Emperor gone, some sought to take his throne and shape the Empire into their own vision. One such person was Darth Malgus. The hero of the Great Galactic War was a brilliant tactician, a diplomat, and a gifted politician. While Republic and Sith forces fought over the Adagen crystal resources on Ilum, Magnus revealed that he had turned traitor and sought to become the new emperor. He envisioned an empire free of petty squabbles and xenophobia. An empire that recognized the potential in all species instead of shunning them due to humans' elitism and classism. Malgus sought to remake the Sith in a way that they would cease destroying themselves. In the end, however, he was defeated and blown into space. Yeah, we know. We were rooting for him too. The Dreadmasters were another problem. The Emperor had been the only being they considered above themselves. With him gone, the Six Lords of Dread sought to spread their terror throughout the galaxy, subjugating and enslaving all life. Initially, they aimed to rule the madness, but when one of their own was slain, they sought to destroy everything, including themselves. The Dread War, as it was called, was one of the first occasions the Republic and Sith forces would somewhat unite against a common enemy. Although they didn't outright work together, they at least accepted each other's presence while they both dealt with the insane Sith. Mercifully, the Dreadmasters were slain and the Republic and Sith could get back to business as usual. The two factions fought over Isotope 5 on Macheb, over Zerka, and generally had a good go at one another until the incident, or rather incidents as it turned out. 
something was amiss. Simultaneously, almost, Republic and Imperial forces attacked and heavily destroyed Korriban and Tython respectively. Both the Jedi Temple and Sith Academy were heavily damaged and instructors on both sides were killed. This might have seemed like a coincidence, but it turned out that there were traitors on both sides. The Revanites Order. Over the last few years, a secret order had begun forming in the galaxy. An order that followed neither faction but Revan himself. They were devoted to finding the Sith Emperor and killing him before he could destroy the galaxy. The Revanites believed that the only way to fully draw the Emperor out was to destabilize the Republic and the Sith Empire so that they could resurrect him and put an end to his evil spirit once and for all. The conspiracy was discovered by one Theron Shen, SIS agent, and Lana Benico, Sith intelligence agent, who teamed up to take out their mutual enemies. With the help of one prominent figure, they set out to uncover the truth for the rest of the galaxy. The small team set out for Manan and Rakata Prime to foil the Revanites' plans. On Rishi, they were able to expose the Revanites' manipulations to the Republic and Imperial fleets, who were moments away from destroying one another above the planet. When they were able to contact the two leaders, Satil Shan, the Grandmaster of the Jedi Order, and Darth Ma, de facto leader of the Dark Council, the two leaders agreed to rendezvous on Yavin 4, where Revan was about to resurrect the Emperor everyone had worked so hard to kill. For the first time ever in galactic history, the Republic and Sith Empire worked together. On Yavin 4, the two factions set up a common base camp where Imperials, Sith, Jedi, and Republic troopers intermingled uneasily. Revan was the common enemy, and although neither side was happy about it, for now, they were allies. Despite the prominent darkness on Yavin 4, both Satil Shan and Darth Ma could sense a strong light side presence in the Force. That turned out to be Revan. Sort of. You see, when he had been liberated from the Foundry, Revan's psyche had fractured from the horrific ordeal he had been through. His dark half had set out to hunt down the Emperor, while his light half wanted to simply rest. Thanks to their combined strength, they were able to break through the Masasi Revan was relying on and the Emperor's Imperial Guard into the temple that Revan had set up a base in. The temple contained a mass ritual sacrifice machine which Revan had planned to use sacrificing all life on Yavin 4 to resurrect the Emperor, then kill him. Thankfully, the Joint Strike Force was able to first destroy the machine, then bring down Revan. With his hatred quenched, Revan's soul was finally able to become whole once again. More importantly, he was able to make peace with his life and the universe, and with a thank you, he finally let go and became one with the Force allegedly. With the Revanite crisis averted, both the Republic and Sith quietly left the moon of Yavin. Their common enemy had been defeated. Even if we had hoped this experience could have taught them the virtue of cooperation, the wheels of politics continued to turn and their heart was set on war. It wasn't long before the galactic war resumed, with both sides a little more mellow, but equally out for blood. Of course, this new outbreak of war would only last very little before both factions were suddenly ambushed by an unknown enemy. Led by a frightfully familiar face, they came out of unknown space to utterly humiliate both of them in a war that was more one-sided than a Wookiee arm wrestling a preschooler. If you recall from our last video, Emperor Vitiate had been defeated at the Hero of Tython, much to the relief of pretty much everyone. Later, when Revan tried to resurrect him, the galaxy went, oh hell nah, and did their best to stop him. At the time, however, it wasn't really clear what the Emperor's true status was. Vitiate, it turns out, didn't take long to clarify. In 3636 BBY, the Republic and Sith Empire were squabbling over the Imperial world of Xyost. The Empire was there because, well, they owned the place, and the Republic was there because they'd heard rumors the Emperor was sniffing around. SIS agents and the Sixth Line, a zealot sect of Jedi, 
had infiltrated the world to look for clues, thus setting the stage for Vitiate's return. With the ritual of possession, Vitiate took over the bodies of the Jedi and several other key figures and explained his plan to absorb all life on the planet. In the end, he succeeded, draining every living being dry save for a few that managed to escape. Ziost was dead. Long live the Emperor. So where had Vitiate been? Well, it turns out the person known as Vitiate wasn't quite what he seemed. The Emperor had begun life as a Sith pureblood hundreds of years ago. Back then, he had been known as Tenebrae and he hungered for power. Using a Sith ritual, much like the one he later deployed on Xyost, he had absorbed all life on his homeworld Nathema. He used his life force to stay alive long past his lifespan. When the body he was in died or decayed, he could move his soul into another body and carry on. That's how he survived the attack during the Cold War. His body died, but he moved on to another one, and this dapper looking fellow was Valkorion. Valkorion, now, found himself bored with his Sith Empire. It was a failure in his eyes, and so he left it behind to find a new toy to play with. That toy was the Eternal Empire of Zakul, and he was its emperor, with a wife and three kids. While the Republic and Sith Empire were busy fighting each other, the Eternal Fleet came out of nowhere, raided their worlds, and retreated back into wild space. Chasing after Valkorion, Darth Maar took the Imperial Fleet and the Outlander, a prominent figure who'd helped uncover the Revenite conspiracy, into wild space, where they were captured by the Eternal Fleet and brought to Zakul. There, Emperor Valkorion greeted them in the throne room and promised them power if they were to kneel. Darth Maar refused and was killed, but before the Outlander could react, one of his sons, Arken, killed his father, put the Outlander in carbonate, and took the throne for himself, from which he waged a destructive and brutal war on the galaxy. Within a year, Arken had conquered the galaxy. His eternal fleets, an Iokath design that far, far exceeded anything the Republic or Sith had to pit against it, devastated their combined militaries and forced a surrender from both factions. The Republic and Sith had to pay heavy tribute to Zakul, and Zakulin control stations, named Star Fortresses, remained in place above key worlds to make sure they towed the line. Although the war was short, it was brutal, with many prominent figures losing their life or going into exile. The Jedi Order was scattered once more, unable to take out the Knights of Zakul. Grandmaster Satil Shen went missing, and Empress Achina took the throne of the Sith Empire. The peace that followed was fragile. For five years, the galaxy held its breath, but under the surface, a resistance was forming. Lana Benico and Theron Shen, the two people instrumental in uncovering the Revenite conspiracy, formed an alliance. This alliance gathered people from all corners of the galaxy, Empire, Republic, and unaffiliated worlds, to bring down their Sakulan overlords. With some effort, they rescued the Outlander, who became the Alliance commander. Things got messy when they realized Valkorion was living in the Outlander's head. But let's back up a step once again. We talked about the Emperor and his family. First, there was Valkorion, who married a Zakulan woman named Senya Teral. She gave birth to two twin boys, Thexan and Arkan, and one girl, Valen. Things didn't go well. Valen was born with incredible force abilities but she was a bit of a sociopath, so they had her shipped out to a weird cult on Nathema to gain control of her, but she doesn't exactly return sane. Meanwhile, Thexen was killed, and his brother never quite forgave their father. Later, when Senya saw what Valkorion was doing, she broke up with him and left her family. So, at this point of the story, we have one ghost emperor in the Outlander's skull, a bitter emperor's son, and his crazy sister. Cool? Cool. So, with Arkan in charge, the Alliance began work on bringing him and his empire down. They tasked themselves with recruiting allies to their cause, sabotaging keys of cool and assets, helping out distressed territories, destroying star fortresses, and so on. Things seemed to be going well, but on one instance, Arkan accepted the Outlander and dealt them a fatal blow. Thanks to Valkorion, they got better. All in all, Valkorion was helpful in a sick, twisted way. His goal had been to possess the Outlander, use them to take down his kids, then possess him fully and live his best life. The Outlander was aware of his end goal, 
But they didn't know what to really do about it, so at first, they focused on taking down Zakul. But the Force was their ally and guided them to an exiled Satil Shen and Darth Ma, who had teamed up and spent the last five years philosophizing. They taught the Outlander a new outlook on the Force that would enable them to fight Arkan head on. Eventually, the conflict escalated and they were able to take Arkan down. Before he could be captured, however, he was rescued by his mother Senya Tyrol. This left his insane sister Valen on the throne, who wasn't so much interested in ruling as she was in burning everything down. It took another several months to be able to bring her down, following which the Alliance had to deal with the Eternal Fleet, which was entirely automated and went rogue after Valen's fall, commencing bombardments of key worlds across the galaxy. The Outlander brought a stop to this by claiming the Eternal Throne, bringing the fleet under the control of the Alliance. Following this, the Alliance became the Eternal Alliance, a fully-fledged galactic superpower that mediated between the Republic and Sith Empire. This state of affairs didn't last long, however. The true nature of the Eternal Fleet is a complicated topic for another day, but suffice to say that a conflict on Iokarth essentially wiped it out, crippling the Eternal Alliance, which essentially merged back into the Republic. With the effective end of the Eternal Alliance, it wasn't long before a third galactic war broke out between the Republic and Sith Empire. The Sith, truth be told, had been planning a resumption of hostilities ever since the formation of the Eternal Alliance. Empress Achina had been quietly arming for a new war for years while publicly working with her soon-to-be enemies against Sakul, and while Achina perished on Iokarth, her successor, Emperor Voron, was eager to follow through on her plans. He began the Third Galactic War with an assault on Ossus, using the former renegade Darth Malgus as a commander for the operation. But as the Sith and the Republic went to war yet again, there was one last loose end from the prior conflicts that had yet to be resolved. Vishit. Arkan's slaying of Valkorion had not finished off the Emperor. He had retained a tie to the world of the living by preserving his original body in stasis and through his presence within the Outlander. During the earlier battle for Zakul, the Outlander had purged his mind of Vishit, while Lord Scourge and Kira Carson had destroyed his original body at roughly the same time. However, this unleashed a plague that Vishit had prepared as a failsafe. It rendered Scourge and Kira comatose, and when Satil Shan and her followers came after them, it infected them as well. This plague was Vishit's final form, and there was only one person left who could stop it, the Outlander. After awakening, Scourge and Kira recruited the Outlander to storm the ship on which Satil and her possessed followers were quarantined, where they hoped to enter the Jedi Master's mind and finish off the Emperor once and for all. Aboard the vessel, they were joined by the spirit of Revan, and together, they entered Satil's mind and confronted the three forms of the Emperor, Valkorion, Darth Vishit, and his original form, a Sith pureblood known as Tenebrae. The three forms of the Emperor battled the Outlander, Scourge, Kira, and Revan, together having the power to resist all four at once. But then Satil Shen awoke, and the spirits of other enemies of the Emperor joined the fight, Mitra Surik, Darth Ma, and countless others. They were the Emperor's victims, and they were also the ones who knew his weakness, his fear of death. They poured their power into the Outlander, who contained and then destroyed the last traces of the Emperor's spirit. At last, he was gone for good. Meanwhile, war continued. After discovering the teachings of an ancient Sith Lord on Elom, Darth Malgus again broke free of the Empire's control and went his own way. The Sith fought a protracted battle with the Republic over control of Manan. The Third Galactic War burned across the galaxy for years before coming to an end, and for decades after the final death of the Emperor, the Sith Empire continued to pose a threat to the galaxy. But it didn't last forever. Over the course of the Galactic Wars, the Sith Empire had undergone several radical transformations. Its three Dark Lords of the Sith, Darth Vishit, Darth Achina, and Darth Voron, had each made changes to the ideology of the Sith and their approach to the outside galaxy. Over time, a curious trend emerged. The Sith Empire slowly became more Empire than Sith. This was already evident in figures like Darth Ma and Lana Benico, who notably prioritized their civilization over their own personal power. And in doing so, they went against the fundamental guiding principle of the Sith. Sith ideology was irreconcilable with a stable civilization. The constant struggle for ultimate power precluded the martial unity that empires require. 
For all prior Sith empires, their Sith ideology ultimately led to schisms and collapse. For the true Sith empire, however, the opposite occurred. In a bid to keep the empire stable, the Sith gradually diluted their own ideology to the point where some of the empire's greatest Sith lords found common ground with the Jedi. Within a century of the start of the Third Galactic War, the Sith Empire fragmented and was eventually destroyed completely. With it died the Sith Purebloods, who went completely extinct as a species within years of its final fall. A few great Sith Lords arose during the Empire's final years, and in the time after its collapse. The last of them was Darth Desilus, a Pawan Jedi Master who became the Dark Lord of the Sith sometime after 3500 BBY. Darth Desilus fought his own brutal war with the Republic and the Jedi, leading an army of dark side acolytes. According to legend, he and his followers were said to have slain 2,000 Jedi in battle. But Desilus too was eventually killed, though it was said to have taken the whole Jedi Council to bring him down. The Sith all but died with him. Darth Desilus was the last Dark Lord of the Sith for over a thousand years. With his death and the final fall of the Sith Empire, the time of the old Sith Wars ended and the Lion of the Dark Lords of the Sith, which had been maintained from the time of Ajunta Pal all the way to the days of Darth Desilus, was broken. The Jedi believed the Sith to be completely extinct, but this wasn't exactly true. A scattering of Sith cults survived on the galactic fringe, preserving the echoes of the old ways in secret. Most were presumably holdouts of the Sith Empire. A few were descended from Revan Sith. It was said that a single Sith Lord had survived too, the disciple of a long line of Sith that had been started by a follower of the Sith Triumvirate. This line continued for over a thousand years, until the time came for a new Dark Lord to arise and revive the Sith. In 2000 BBY, an Umbaran Jedi Master named Phanius left the Order. He had long been a controversial figure among the Jedi. He was intelligent and charismatic, earning him the respect of many of his peers, but he held solipsistic views that the Jedi Council condemned as heterodox, arguing that he was the only person he could be sure really existed. The ideological difference with the Council was what drove him to leave the Jedi, who Phanius had come to resent for rejecting his views. He became determined to make them all pay for what he saw as their ignorance of his enlightened beliefs, and so he sought out the remnants of the Sith. Guided by a stolen Sith holocron, Phanius fell to the dark side and set about infiltrating and seizing control of the various Sith cults scattered across the galaxy, uniting them under a single banner in a bid to form a new Sith Empire. Once he had gathered all the remnants of the Sith, he claimed the ancient title of Dark Lord of the Sith, taking the name Darth Ruin and revealing himself to the galaxy. Former admirers of his left the Jedi Order and joined Ruin as Sith, 50 at first, and then many more. So began the fourth great schism, which itself was only the opening salvo of the new Sith Wars. Darth Ruin and his followers became the new Sith and they carved out their own empire in the Outer Rim, taking advantage of gridlock in the Senate to seize territory from the paralyzed Republic. These new Sith were much less organized than their forebears had been, composed of a dizzying array of cults under the loose command of Darth Ruin, less an organized empire than a vast confederation of megalomaniacs. Ruin himself was the most megalomaniacal of all. He had come to embrace the idea that he was the only being in the universe who actually existed and, as a result, treated everyone else as garbage, illusions meant solely to help him amass power. This ideology led Ruin to throw away the lives of his followers en masse in battles with the Republic and the Jedi. And, understandably, Ruin's disciples weren't terribly happy with that. Just a few years into his reign as Dark Lord of the Sith, a group of Darth Ruin's students murdered him, prematurely ending his campaign to rule the galaxy. They then immediately turned on each other, fracturing Ruin's empire into a jumbled mess of Sith kingdoms which were at odds with each other as much as the Jedi. But though Ruin was dead and the new Sith were in chaos, the Sith survived and their war with the galaxy continued for centuries to come. For over 200 years after the death of Darth Ruin, the new Sith were constantly at odds with each other over who would become the new Dark Lord. The Republic was in an even worse state due to the slow implosion of its overloaded bureaucratic structures, and without its support, the Jedi struggled to stop the advance of the new Sith, 
despite their disunity. The Sith conquered a swath of territory in the northeast Outer Rim, reclaiming the ancient Sith worlds of Xyost and Yavin 4, and they launched countless raids into Republic space, causing chaos wherever they could. Then, in 1750 BBY, they finally united under a sole Dark Lord again. This new Dark Lord was the Dark Underlord, an ancient dark side spirit brought out of chaos to lead the armies of Sith into battle. This vengeful wraith amassed a legion of fanatical darksiders known as the Black Knights, who took over the new Sith and led a bloody campaign against the Republic, terrorizing the Zona Mickey hyperspace route from their base on Malrev 4. Fortunately for the galaxy though, the reign of the Dark Underlord didn't last long. The Jedi Master Murtug led a dedicated team of Jedi Knights in a counter-offensive against the Black Knights, and he successfully recruited the Mandalorians to join the fight against the Sith. In the Battle of Melrev 4, the Mandalorians crushed the Dark Underlord's armies, while Murtag himself banished the Dark Spirit back to chaos. The pressures of the battle turned Murtag to the Dark Side, however, and he defected to the new Sith soon afterwards. The war would continue, and the Dark Underlord's defeat was little more than a hiccup in the Sith's endless campaign. In the following centuries, the Sith spread all across the Rim and began pushing inwards from all sides, slowly strangling the Republic. But by around 1500 BBY, 500 years into the new Sith Wars, their offensives slowly began to stagnate. The Republic, with the help of the Jedi, won major victories against the Sith at Corfelion, Gap 9, and King's Galquek, and it seemed like the tides were slowly turning. But then, everything fell apart. The new Sith managed to recruit the Deveronians and Hishians as allies, and as those species began their own wars with the Republic, the Sith began massing troops at Mizra in the Inner Rim. In 1466 BBY, the Jedi and the Republic attacked this Sith mustering ground, sparking one of the largest battles of the new Sith Wars. Dozens of Sith Lords participated in this battle, riding into the fray on customized speeder bikes named after predatory beasts they believed symbolized their innermost nature. At first, the battle went well for the Jedi and their followers, as their army was guided by a Jedi coordinator using battle meditation. But at the height of the battle, the coordinator was killed by a Sith sniper, and the Sith took full advantage of the resultant confusion, utterly massacring the Jedi in one of the biggest routs in galactic history. More than 500,000 Republic soldiers and Jedi were killed, and hundreds of Jedi were captured, tortured, and turned to the dark side. The Battle of Mizra was a huge victory for the Sith. It cost the Republic control of the entire Outer Rim, and much of the Mid-Rim and Expansion region fell under Sith control. The Battle of Mizra might have resulted in the total destruction of the Republic if the new Sith were not held back by infighting over the title of Dark Lord yet again. Despite this, the Sith consolidated their power throughout the late 1400s BBY, and sometime after 1417 BBY, they united under a single leader once again, Darth Riven, an extremely powerful Sith Lord who made it his mission to find a way to save the Sith from themselves. Darth Riven spent most of his reign holed up in a fortress on Almas, ruling the new Sith through his apprentices while he worked on his pet project, the Sith Battlelords. These were his solution to the Sith's plague of infighting, a class of warriors who were mindlessly loyal to the Sith Lords and who were bonded to their soldiers through the Force. Through an arcane Sith ritual that involved cutting open prospective battle lords and having their troops march through the pools of their blood, a battle lord's troops were bound to their commander, and any injury they attempted to inflict on their superiors would instead be inflicted on themselves. Riven's battle lords dramatically improved battlefield performance of the Sith armies, and for a while, this paid off. The Sith won victory after victory, and the Republic was driven to the brink. But the Battle Lords couldn't fix the new Sith's true problem, the Sith ideology itself, which demanded infighting and competition. Ultimately, Riven was slain by his own apprentice, and the Sith were forced to stop using Battle Lords once the Jedi started targeting them to free their bonded soldiers, who usually had no loyalty to the Sith after being forced into these rituals. 
Despite the death of Darth Riven, things continued to get worse. After the Battle of Misra, the Republic began a slow implosion, hemorrhaging territory as civilization itself began to fragment. Plague swept across Republic space and whole swathes of the galaxy lost holonet access and trade relations with Republic worlds, cutting them off from everyone else. In 1400 BBY, the Senate gave the Supreme Chance III to a Jedi Master, and for the next 400 years, the position would be exclusively held by Jedi who were basically the only ones propping up the Republic at this point. Some Jedi took command of the sectors the Republic had left behind, becoming Jedi Lords and establishing their own personal militaries to fend off pirates and Sith. After Darth Riven, the next Dark Lord of the Sith was a Shido shapeshifter named Belia Dazu. She rose to power sometime before 1250 BBY, and in her secret fortress on Tython, she created a plague worse than anything that had struck the Republic so far. Dazu's creation was the Nanogene Spore, a product of Sith alchemy, an insidious technovirus that caused those who came into contact with it to grow mechanical tumors, which steadily cannibalized their hosts, turning their flesh into metal and lobotomizing them. The victim of Dazu's plague became zombie-like monsters of twisted metal, techno beasts loyal only to Dazu herself. She assembled an army of techno beasts called the Metanecrons and led them into battle against the Republic and the Jedi in the 20 years Sissets Wars, which lasted from 1250 BBY to 1230 BBY. Dazu terrorized the galaxy with her techno beast plague, which even Jedi were vulnerable to. She was only defeated when the Mercrosa Order, who were ostensibly allies of the new Sith, got upset at the Meadow Necrons encroaching on their territory and assassinated Dazu. But her followers fought on, and the Sictus Wars ended in a victory for the new Sith, though the threat of the Techno Beast Plague was eliminated. The new Sith, though leaderless once more, capitalized on their victory in the Sictus Wars, pushing ever deeper into Republic space. By 1100 BBY, the Republic was all but completely crushed, and Coruscant itself was at the mercy of the Sith. But in their moment of triumph, the Sith destroyed themselves once again, as the Sith Lords squabbled over who would become Dark Lord of the Sith once Coruscant had fallen. This time, the result was an all-out Sith civil war, which annihilated the new Sith Empire and greatly diminished the strength of the Sith. But the Republic was unable to capitalize on the Sith civil war. It was a shadow of its former self at this point, with only the core, the colonies, and pockets along the major hyperspace routes remaining in its control. Most of the galaxy was thrown into total anarchy, with neither the Republic nor the Sith strong enough to lay claim to them. This lasted for nearly a hundred years, a century known as the Republic Dark Age. In this time, the only hope for the galaxy was the Jedi Lords, who kept the squabbling Sith Warlords away from their protectorates. For decades, the Sith barely paid any attention to the Republic, instead carving out kingdoms in the sectors the Republic had left behind. These kingdoms regularly fractured into rump states led by competing Sith Lords. Notably, this happened in the Grumani Sector, where the absolute lunatics Diamond and Odeon divided their mother's Sith Kingdom between them, fighting an endless war with each other while the people of the Sector suffered. Occasionally, rogue Jedi Knights like Kara Holt would intervene in these troubled sectors, but the Jedi and the Republic typically lacked the resources to liberate them outright. And so, after over 900 years of fighting, the New Sith Wars reached an impasse, with the Republic, the Jedi, and the New Sith all weak and incapable of ruling the galaxy. The New Sith had the opportunity every order of Sith before them had dreamed of, but the individualistic and hyper-competitive nature of the Dark Side was holding them back, turning them against each other. It would take the vision of a new Dark Lord of the Sith to reunite them, heralding in the final chapter of the New Sith Wars, a 10-year conflict that would decide the fate of the galaxy. As we mentioned in the last video, the chaos of the Republic Dark Age led to the Jedi taking a more active role in galactic governance. Since 1400 BBY, the position of Supreme Chancellor had been exclusively held by Jedi, as the Order was pretty much the only thing propping the crumbling Republic up. Meanwhile, out in the regions where the Republic no longer existed, 
Jedi Watchmen assumed rule of systems and sectors, becoming Jedi Lords. They and their heirs kept their territories safe from Sith and pirates, and much of the galaxy saw them as noble heroes, the only ones standing between the bloodthirsty Sith warlords and billions of innocent people. But not everyone liked the Jedi Lords. The Jedi Council certainly didn't. They were concerned with how the Lords tended to play fast and loose with Jedi doctrine and with how they were essentially feudal lords. To make matters worse, many of their own students started idolizing some of the lords, such as Lord Hoth, who was a legend for his campaigns against the Sith in the Outer Rim. Thus, the Jedi sought their own champion to take command of the fight against the Sith, and for this task, they chose the newly promoted Jedi Master Skere Khan. This choice was ill-advised. Not long after he was dispatched to join the fight against the Sith, Khan fell to the dark side himself. He, like many other Sith warlords at the time, claimed the title of Dark Lord of the Sith, and he converted most of the Jedi the Council had sent with him on his campaign. At first, Khan claimed to the Council that he was making a bid for control of the Sith so as to contain their threat. And the Council, which didn't want to believe that they had messed up so badly, believed this at first. They even sent formal congratulations to Khan as he and his followers won campaign after campaign against rival Sith Lords, destroying some of the worst warlords and usurping control of their armies. By the time the Council saw sense, it was too late. Khan was well on his way to reuniting the new Sith. He gathered the Sith under the banner of the Brotherhood of Darkness, and by the end of 1010 BBY, he had successfully recruited or destroyed all of the other Sith factions. To unite the Sith, however, Khan made some radical ideological sacrifices. He built his brotherhood on recognizing others' claims to the title of Dark Lord of the Sith, proclaiming that all Dark Lords would be equal in the Brotherhood of Darkness. Though Khan's vision of the Sith philosophy, what he called rule by the strong, adhered to the usual might makes right ideology of the Sith, Khan contended that strength and power were eroded by constant infighting, and that a degree of unity and equality were required for the strongest in the galaxy to maintain their power. This flew in the face of some of the core precepts of Sith ideology, and it meant that the Brotherhood worked a lot differently from prior Sith orders. The Brotherhood of Darkness was led by a Sith Council of 16 Dark Lords of the Sith, all of them nominally equal. Lord Khan, of course, was somewhat of a first among equals, but other Dark Lords with considerable power included Lord Cordis, Lord Kasim, Lord Kopesh, and Sevisvar. Each of them controlled their own factions of the Brotherhood, and below each of them were numerous Sith Lords, the best and brightest Force Adepts in Khan's armies. The Brotherhood's Sith Lords included Borthis, Hezoran, Shenayag, and Orultha and they were all trained at Cordis's rebuilt Sith Academy on Korriban. Khan encouraged his Sith Lords to amass their own armies and conquer worlds in the name of the Brotherhood, but he forbade all of them from using the title of Darth, which he blamed for much of the Sith's infighting and disunity. Below the Sith Lords were several orders of lesser Sith, each trained at academies across the Brotherhood. Less skilled Sith Adepts and Apprentices were trained on Dathomir or Iridonia and served the Sith Lords directly, while Sith Assassins and Spies trained on Ryloth, Umbara and Nashadar served them more discreetly, hunting down Jedi to kill or capture. There were also Sith Warriors and Marauders who were trained on Gentis, Gamor and Honiga and were tasked with leading the regular armies of the Brotherhood into battle. Like the Jedi Lords and the Republic, Khan's Sith controlled vast armies of non-force sensitives who served at the bottom of the Brotherhood's hierarchy. All told, Khan's Brotherhood of Darkness functioned less like a Sith Empire and more like, as Darth Bane put it, a twisted perversion of the Jedi Order. Unfortunately for the Jedi, the unsithiness of the Brotherhood made it a far greater threat than any new Sith faction before it. From their capital on Rune, they conquered vast swaths of the Rim, amassing an army of 20,000 Sith to topple the Republic with. Fortunately for the galaxy, however, the Jedi wouldn't let Khan win without a fight. To challenge the Brotherhood of Darkness, Lord Hoth rallied the forces of Jedi Lords, forming the Army of the Light. 
He and his followers fought a 10-year war with the Brotherhood of Darkness, during which the Jedi won several major victories. At first, the Brotherhood had a decisive advantage. After retaking Korriban, they won battles at Enoch, Ando, Monastery, Chabim, and Dorin. But Hoth's tactical genius allowed the Jedi to best the Brotherhood at Hoth, Dramunkas, and Malrev IV, denying the Sith control of some of their ancient strongholds. The Sith responded with an offensive against what was left of the Republic. The Brotherhood won battles all over the galaxy, crushing Republic forces on Kashyyyk, Trandosha, Fasira, Alaris Prime, Bespin, Salas, Tanab, and Harpori. By 1002 BBY, they were able to push far into Republic space, hitting Mindor and Castell. But the Army of the Light didn't fall into Khan's trap. Jedi loyal to the High Council rallied Republic forces and fended off the Sith at Burmese Kori, Pax, Denon, Druckenwell, and Corson. The Army of Light kept up a constant offensive against the Brotherhood, continuing to attack targets within their territory. Ord Mantell, Sanraf VI, Sai Mirth, and even Rune itself, the Brotherhood capital, fell to Hoth's allies, who also prevented incursions into Republic space at Geyser, Gindin, and Ambria. Over several grueling years of war, the Brotherhood and the Army of Light wore each other out, fighting to a draw in the grand scheme of things. Khan preached that victory was just around the corner, but in truth, Hoth was whittling away the strength of the Brotherhood, and not even Khan's battle meditation could stop the Army of Light. In 1002 BBY, faced with the eventual defeat by attrition if he kept trying to defeat Hoth head-on, Khan switched tactics, attempting one final assault on the Republic, hoping to finish it off and thus destroy Hoth's base of support. To this end, the Brotherhood conquered the obscure mid-rim planet Rusan to use as a base of operations, planning to advance from Rusan through the slice to the core worlds. The Republic tried to take Rusan back, but Khan and his followers easily drove them off. Trusting that Rusan was secure, Khan set off on a campaign in the core worlds where he captured Brentil IV, bringing the Brotherhood within reach of Coruscant. But then, the Army of Light made an unexpected move. The Jedi attacked Rusan and liberated it. Unwilling to let Rusan go, Khan counterattacked and won another victory on the planet with the help of the turncoat Jedi, Githany, only to lose two further battles against Lord Hoth. As this Rusan campaign escalated, both the Army of Lights and the Brotherhood of Darkness committed more and more of their forces to it, unwilling to surrender what had become a vital mustering point. By a thousand BBY, Khan and Hoth had summoned all of their followers to Rusan, each desperate to annihilate the other. Rusan had gone from being a mere mustering ground to the site of the last confrontation between the Brotherhood and the army. As he committed fully to taking Rusan and crushing Hoth, Lord Khan summoned every single Sith Lord to his camp on the planet, just as Hoth and the Jedi Lords were doing with their own followers. Among the Sith Lords who heeded this call was a recent graduate from the Korriban Academy, a man who called himself Darth Bane. After studying the history of the Sith and the teachings of Darth Revan, Bane had come to despise Lord Khan and the Brotherhood, which he saw as perversions of the Sith teachings. After killing Lord Kas Im on Rakata Prime, he came to Rusan hoping to guide the Sith back to what he saw as the true path. Lord Khan, understanding the threat Bane posed, tried to have several of his Sith Lords kill him, but Bane survived all these assassination attempts. Instead of challenging Khan over them, however, Bane offered him a truce in the form of two ancient force techniques he had learned from Revan's Holocron. He proposed the Sith employ the first, a telekinetic wave, in the next battle with the Jedi, and Khan acquiesced, allowing Bane to lead the assembled Sith Lords in forming a meditation circle. In the seventh battle of Rusan, under Bane's guidance, the Sith pulled their strength and unleashed the raw power of the dark side upon the army of light, devastating Hoth's forces. But Khan was concerned that Bane would win control of the Brotherhood if his strategy won the Sith the battle, so he broke the circle early, urging the Sith to take their speeder bikes and pursue the retreating Jedi. The rest of the Brotherhood followed him, routing the Jedi army and killing several of their best. But this was a catastrophic mistake. During the rout, the Jedi received reinforcements in the form of Lord Valentine Fafala, 
and 300 additional Jedi Knights who annihilated Khan's armies, forcing the remaining Sith Lords to retreat deep into Rusan's valleys. This tactical blunder pretty much handed Rusan to the Jedi, destroying the Brotherhood's armies and killing many of Khan's greatest Sith Lords. Unable to cope with the massive L he had just taken, Lord Khan started to go insane, which Darth Bane exploited to his own ends. Bane convinced Khan to try out the other technique he had learned from Revan, the Thought Bomb, a dark side ritual that absorbed the souls of all within the blast radius, imprisoning them in an obelisk of force energy. Believing that he and his followers were strong enough to survive such a blast if they worked together, Khan prepared a Thought Bomb deep in Rusan's caves, while what was left of his army waited on the surface, setting a trap for the Jedi. Upon learning of Khan's plans, Lord Hoth set out to stop the Mad Dark Lord, but with a clap of his hands, Khan detonated the Thought Bomb, and he, Hoth, and everyone else in a wide radius was killed. So ended the Seventh Battle of Rusan, the Brotherhood of Darkness, and the New Sith as a whole. Khan had gathered all of his Sith Lords, together with the vast majority of his lesser Sith on Rusan, and the Thought Bomb consumed them all. All that remained of the Sith after Rusan were the Brotherhood's non-Force-sensitive armies, which promptly surrendered, and a few Acolytes, Dark Jedi, and Assassins, who the Jedi wiped out in short order. After a thousand years of war, the Sith Lords had finally been wiped out, or so the galaxy believed. A single Sith Lord survived the Seventh Battle of Rusan, Darth Bane. Claiming the title of Dark Lord of the Sith, he established the Rule of Two, which would govern his new order of the Sith Lords. Hoping to avoid the mistakes of the new Sith and the constant self-destruction the Sith had shown all throughout their history, he decreed that, going forward, there would only ever be two Sith Lords, a master to embody the power and an apprentice to crave it. On the battlefield of Rusan, he recruited a young girl named Xana to be his apprentice, and in secret, the two of them kept the teachings of the Sith alive. Two there should be, no more, no less. One to embody the power, the other to crave it. So decreed Darth Bane, then the sole surviving Lord of the Sith in 1000 BBY. This doctrine, the rule of two, became the guiding principle of the Sith for the next thousand years, and it was instituted to solve what Bane saw as the fatal flaw of the new Sith. For a thousand years, the new Sith had the Republic and the Jedi on the back foot, but they were constantly squandering their strength with pointless infighting. Battles over the title of Dark Lord of the Sith were common, and groups of weaker apprentices would regularly band together to kill stronger masters, as happened to Darth Ruin, weakening the Sith as a whole. Bane's predecessor, Lord Khan, tried to resolve this issue with his Brotherhood of Darkness, which restricted competition and made the Sith into a dark mirror of the Jedi Order which Bane saw as an affront to Sith ideology. Thus, he manipulated Khan into destroying himself and the other Sith of the Brotherhood on Rusan so that he could rebuild the Sith from the ground up. The new Sith's problems stemmed from a contradiction within Sith ideology, one which we've seen play out countless times over 6,000 years of Sith history. The ideology of the Sith preached extreme individualism and constant competition, championing selfishness and personal power to the exclusion of all else. The Sith believed that only the strongest deserved to rule, and that the strongest could only prove their strength through competition. This encouraged Sith to constantly betray each other, and it made any Sith Empire self-sabotaging, as empire building required a sort of martial unity that was anathema to Sith ideology. The structure of most Sith orders made this problem worse by giving multiple weaker Sith an opportunity to band together to take down stronger masters. This contradiction made the ideology of the Sith inherently self-destructive, and all prior Sith Orders had to make a choice between destroying themselves or watering down Sith ideology. Bane's rule of two was the only solution to this contradiction. Bane did away with the armies and empires, the legions of apprentices and councils of lords. He limited the Sith to a single Dark Lord of the Sith, a master, and a single shadow hand, their apprentice. In doing so, Bane believed competition, which was the way of the Sith, could be encouraged without squandering strength. Without other apprentices to ally with, after all, 
The lesser of the two Sith Lords would need to become stronger to become the master. Thus, with every generation, the strength of the Sith would increase, and to Bane, that was all that mattered. Bane's rule of two came in tandem with a new plan for victory. Rather than trying to conquer the galaxy by force, Bane's Sith Grand Plan called for the Sith to strike from the shadows, manipulating the galaxy into coming under Sith control. Treachery, after all, was the way of the Sith, and historically, the Sith had always performed best when working from the shadows, as the Sith Triumvirate did in the Dark Wars. Bane hoped his plan would lead to the extermination of the Jedi and the total triumph of the Sith, but he didn't believe this would happen in his lifetime. Rather, his plan would take centuries to come to fruition, guided all the while by his order of the Sith Lords. Before leaving Rusan, Bane took a young Force-sensitive girl to be his apprentice, Darth Xana. The two settled on desolate Umbria, and for 10 years, Bane raised the young girl as a Sith Lord, teaching her everything he knew and testing her against the Hissus dragons of the planet's Lake Nut. Xana became a powerful Sith Lord, particularly skilled in the obscure art of Sith sorcery, and Bane constantly reminded her that, per the rule of two, she would kill him and take an apprentice of her own when she was strong enough to do so. Ten years after Rusan, Bane and Xana were discovered and nearly destroyed by the Jedi during a misadventure on Tython. Thanks to Xana's Sith sorcery though, the two were able to escape, and the Jedi were tricked into believing they had killed Darth Bane. Instead, Xana had driven a childhood friend of hers mad and set him up as Darth Bane, and the Jedi, who didn't know what Bane looked like, fell for the ruse and killed him. As part of this encounter, the Jedi learned of the Rule of Two and Bane's reformed Order of Sith Lords, but they believed they had nipped the threat of these new Sith in the bud. They were, of course, wrong. After this incident, Bane and Xana spent the next 10 years covertly manipulating the galaxy. A lot of this work involved ensuring that the Republic was able to rebuild and remain intact. As Bane reasoned, the collapse of the Republic would mean that the Sith would have to topple multiple splinter states, which was harder than seizing control of one galaxy-spanning Republic. The two crafted civilian identities for themselves, posing as Sep and Alia Omek, and moved to Siu Trick 4, where they bought a mansion and began amassing a vast personal fortune based on that of the late Lord Cordis, whose IGBC account Bane was able to seize control of. During this time, Bane's health began to deteriorate due to his immersion in the dark side, but for a while, Xana showed no sign of betraying him. This infuriated Bane, who feared she would wait until he was weak to strike, thus defeating the purpose of the Rule of Two. Thus, Bane sought out and found the holocron of Darth and Dedu, which taught him the power of Essence Transfer, a dark side ability that would allow Bane to take over the body of another. He planned to take over Xana's body and find a new apprentice, and to replace Xana, he selected an Iktochi Huntress he named Darth Cognus. But Xana was unwilling to be replaced, and on Ambria, Darth Xana fought one last battle with Darth Bane. Xana won, and though Bane attempted to survive via Essence Transfer, Xana thwarted his attempt and destroyed his spirit. She took Darth Cognus as her apprentice, allowing the Order of the Sith Lords to continue. Xana and Cognus continued Bane's grand plan, with Xana inheriting the fortune she and her master had amassed and passing it on to Cognus. Darth Cognus eventually slew Darth Xana and took an apprentice of her own, Darth Millennial, a three-eyed human mutant. But Millennial disagreed with many aspects of Bane's ideology, especially the Rule of Two, bringing him into conflict with his master, who was totally committed to Bane's doctrine. Eventually, she branded Millennial a heretic and kicked him out of the Order. Millennial went on to found another Dark Side cult, the Prophets of the Dark Side, while Cognus took on another apprentice. For centuries, the line of Bane continued. Roughly 30 Dark Lords of the Sith came after Darth Bane, most of whom very little is known about. One such Sith Lord was Darth Vectivus. The noteworthy Dark Lord after Cognus was Darth Gravid, who ruled circa 533 BBY. Gravid was unique among the Baneite Sith Lords in that he actually turned back to the light, destroying much of the Sith lore that he had amassed in his fortress on Jaguada. He was stopped by his apprentice, Darth Gien, who claimed the title of Dark Lord and slew her master, despite suffering extreme injuries in the process. 
But Darth Gravid still did considerable damage, and many Sith techniques were lost forever, including Essence Transfer. Nonetheless, the Order of the Sith survived thanks to Darth Gien. She was eventually followed by Darth Ramage, and then by an unnamed Dark Lord who, together with his apprentice, Darth Tenebris, created a wound in the Force around 167 BBY, allowing the Jedi to sense the growing power of the Dark Side for the first time in centuries. Tenebris, a Bith who was a starship designer named Rujes Nome in his day-to-day -day life, eventually killed his master and became the new Dark Lord. Instead of seeking out an apprentice the normal way, Tenebris, who was a scientist at heart, paid off a Mun couple to produce a child he calculated would be strong in the Force. When the child's strength in the Force became apparent, Tenebris took custody of the boy, whom he named Darth Plagueis. In Tenebris and Plagueis' time, the Sith Grand Plan was steadily approaching fruition. The Order of the Sith Lords had amassed a vast network of spies, contacts and puppets, as well as an enormous fortune and a treasure trove of artifacts and lore. The Republic was becoming increasingly corrupt, the Jedi were becoming increasingly blind, and Sith-influenced corporations were becoming incredibly powerful. When Plagueis betrayed Tenebrus in 67 BBY and took the mantle of Dark Lord for himself, he believed the final victory of the Sith was near at hand. For his apprentice, Plagueis chose a young Naboo aristocrat named Palpatine, whom he named Darth Sidious. Sidious, as Palpatine, went into galactic politics, eventually becoming senator for the Chummel Sector, while Plagueis operated as banking clan executive Hego the Mask. The two plotted to seize control of the Republic and wipe out the Jedi by installing Sidious as Supreme Chancellor. And they spent decades laying the groundwork for this plan, with Sidious stoking corruption in the Senate and Plagueis manipulating the galaxy's megacorporations into arming and preparing for civil war. But over the years, Plagueis steadily became distracted from the Grand Plan. He, like many Sith before him, was obsessed with the idea of achieving eternal life, and he had found a novel way to do so. Plagueis was a staunch materialist, and he saw the Force through a scientific light, not a religious one, as a poorly understood form of energy instead of an all-powerful entity. The key to this, he believed, was the midichlorians, which he became obsessed with manipulating and controlling. He made considerable progress on this technique, achieving the ability to micromanage midichlorians for the purposes of killing or healing. Plagueis' research became an obsession that he eventually spent all of his time on, while Sidious did the work of preparing for the fulfillment of the Grand Plan. To help him in this, Sidious trained a Dathomirian Zabrak, whom he named Darth Maul, to act as his Sith assassin. Plagueis was aware of and approved of this. Since Maul was merely a Sith assassin, not a Sith Lord, he didn't see it as a violation of the Rule of Two. Not that Plagueis cared much for the Rule of Two. In fact, he believed that he and Sidious would render it obsolete, as he believed his work would allow them to live forever. After Sidious's training was complete, the two began acting more as equal partners than master and apprentice, and Plagueis believed that the Rule of Two had been superseded. In 32 BBY, after decades of planning, the start of the final stage of the Sith Grand Plan began. Sidious and Plagueis manipulated the Trade Federation into invading Naboo, and while Sidious sent Darth Maul to help with the invasion, he and Plagueis manipulated the Senate into making him Supreme Chancellor. Riding on a wave of sympathy over the invasion of his homeworld, Darth Sidious assumed control of the Republic. With his victory secure, he turned on Plagueis. As the two celebrated their victory on the night of Sidious's election, Plagueis fell asleep after drinking too much wine, and Sidious killed him with a blast of Force Lightning, proclaiming himself the Dark Lord of the Sith. You know how the story goes from here. With the help of his apprentices, first Darth Tyrannus and then Darth Vader, Darth Sidious used the Clone Wars to destroy the Jedi Order and transform the Republic into the Galactic Empire. The Sith Grand Plan was a success. Once more, the Sith ruled the galaxy, and the vision of Darth Bane was fulfilled. But the Sith's ultimate victory didn't last. A mere 20 years after the rise of the Empire, Darth Sidious was slain by Darth Vader, who returned to the light through the guidance of his son, Luke. With his death and Vader's redemption, the line of Darth Bane was ended, and though future generations of Darksiders would claim to be Sith, the Darkside had taken a blow that it would never recover from.